This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's yes. guest, we've got Africa. Brooke, Africa, how are we? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited. Um, and surprisingly a little bit nervous, but I think it's excited nerves. Why nervous? Because when I sit down, I don't like to know where a conversation is going to go. So I think that can bring up just natural sort of feelings of nerves. But it's also because I know how open you are you're very open in the way that I am and you don't mind really going there so I think a part of me is sort of curious as to what that's yeah that's going to look like we'll create magic today but first and foremost we'll promote your new book The Third Perspective unbelievable about self-sabotage about change Mm. about not living in fear but we all do we all self-sabotage we all live in fear yeah fear's what drives me everything I do is because I'm scared how the book talk to me about it first of all where can people buy it thank you so you can buy it wherever you find books it depends where you are in the world but all the booksellers amazon barnes and noble um also make sure you support your independent booksellers with this but um the idea of the third perspective actually can i ask you when you hear the third perspective how does it sort of register what do you get from the title Third perspective for me, obviously, I know you talk about uh, non-binary and stuff, Mm -hmm. it can be, but um, third perspective is me is looking from the outside, from both sides, yes, and then looking at it directly, and then taking your perspective out of it, Yes, Um, but it can mean, I think, what's the third third perspective meaning an addiction, something to do with, what what is it? I googled it earlier, but I didn't really. Yeah, I I think you, you pretty much nailed it. To me, the third perspective, and I'm sure we're going to go into more of the specifics, but I just think we're in a bit of a dangerous time right now where there is so much fucking pressure. Can I swear in this? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. (laughs) Um, There's so much pressure to pick sides. You know, you have to prove your goodness. Are you left? Are you right? Are you woke? Are you anti-woke? Are you pro? Are you anti? There's just... I think there's so much sort of putting people into boxes and I think, I think the average person is just getting fed up of it. And to me, the third perspective is just an invitation for people to find the middle ground, the middle path, which is where I actually think a lot of us exist. Um, And the title of the book is Brave Expression in the Age of Intolerance, because I think we've become so intolerant of opposing views. We don't know how to speak to people and disagree in a healthy way. We believe that everyone should have the same worldview. Um, And I think it's making us all just so unable to exist together and to operate in reality. So to me, this is, I think of this book as like the, 
And it's a big statement to make, but I do think it's the cure and antidote to what we call cancel culture. And I just haven't seen anyone tackling it in this way. I think there are a lot of people having the culture war conversation in a very academic way that isn't accessible to the average person. It feels very classist, a lot of the conversations. So I just wanted to write something and to use my expertise as a developmental coach, as a consultant, as a speaker, a researcher, to create something that isn't just ranting, but something that gives people actual solutions so we can communicate effectively. So yeah, that's what the third perspective is in terms of inspiration. But my story of getting sober is woven into this because when I was deep into addiction, this is why I resonate with you and your story. When I was deep into addiction, I could not see another option. I really thought the only option was to drink and get fucked out of my mind or else I can't connect or else I can't have sex or else I can't have a conversation or else I can't feel comfortable. There was no, there was no middle ground in that way of thinking. It was all or nothing. Um, So yeah, I I always like asking people what their initial sort of feel is when they hear the third perspective, but you pretty much nailed it. Yeah, everybody will see that differently. If you Google the word the third perspective, the meaning of it's totally different from what I've said. Mm -hmm. But I just get that from an outsider's point of view. Yes. Um, And like you say, it's not to scream from the rooftops of your own beliefs, because we all see the world differently. We've all been raised differently, different levels of trauma, different levels of pain, which we'll touch on. But today we'll create magic, we'll try and change mm. lives, we'll try and under, educate people of an understanding and not to just be one dimensional and just yes. follow the rules or follow what you believe because not everything is what you see is 100% accurate mm. and we're all full of shit. We're all just trying to survive in this wacky world and all we can do is try and be the better version that we can be. But again, like we speak about, we always talk about a bit of greed or something missing or not feeling truly satisfied or fulfilled. Will we ever be truly fulfilled? I don't know, because everything is limitless, but we can only fucking try. How do you define, um, for you, what would being fulfilled look like? Because it's such an interesting word, and I I feel like you and I were having that conversation before this one that we're having now, but it seems like a conversation that I'm having with a lot of people in my life, especially people that are successful. Some of who are my clients, some who are just friends, some who I just end up having a conversation with. This idea that, almost this thing of, I've never defined what enough looks like. And I'm really starting to experience the pain of that because I'm getting all of these things that you would think Mm -hmm show that I'm at a point of arrival, but it feels so empty, you know, after a very brief period. But I'm I'm always curious as to what does fulfillment look like, you I know? D- I don't think we can ever truly answer that. We can talk mm. about family, kids, and being a book right. author, having followers on yeah, social yeah. media, having status, having money, having the perfect partner. But there's always an element of more. I don't mm. know if it's ingrained in human beings to have more, want more. Same as men, everything's to compete. Everybody's to be the best. Everything's competition. So you're never going to be truly satisfied. You'll get small mm. small bursts of bliss in that moment for 10, 20 seconds. But then it, it fizzles and then it's on to the next. I just don't think we're ever truly satisfied. Or else we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be on social media. We wouldn't be writing books. Mm. We wouldn't want to be on podcast hosts. We do, do that because think? there's an element of wanting more it's like <clears throat> having a little badge of honor that your life's going good you right. got a great podcast you're doing amazing but really it doesn't fucking change anything because i battle more now that i'm more successful more money than i was at the start of the journey coming off the drink coming off the drugs uh-huh i'm struggle more and battle more because it becomes more responsibilities more pressure everything is just becomes heightened Mm. of chasing something so i'm becoming more disconnected the more popular i become the more disconnected i become because Mm. i'm craving external attention for gratification that i'm doing okay because it's just a shield it's like a little plaster of pretend yeah because it's all bullshit it's it's interesting because the way that i for me personally the way that i experience it it's kind of like even when i talk about the book james and everything that i do I have such a healthy detachment to all of it. It could all just disappear right now and I'll be okay. I feel like it it all means something, but it doesn't mean much. And I, I, I do credit that thinking 
to my sobriety because after relapsing so many fucking times and seeing my shadow in the most unimaginable ways and I say my shadow because it, it really is those parts of me that I was repressing for a very long time and why I resonated with you when you were talking about compulsive lying or manipulation which is what I talk about when I I really thought stopping drinking snorting whatever all of those things would just go away but they didn't I just had to actually look at them in the eye and deal with them so I think when I was actually able to sustain sobriety and I'll be nine years sober this year I realized that all of these other things outside of me actually don't mean anything so for me fulfillment and I think you're right in that maybe you can never really lock down a firm definition. It could be ever-changing. You think you're fulfilled in this thing, but actually it doesn't, it, it's novelty wears off and it doesn't feel that good anymore, you know. Um, but for me, true fulfillment, I realize, is my relationships on some level. I don't believe that I'm able to get everything from them, but I know what it was like to not have any relationships, to have fucked up and burnt so many bridges and to have no one by my side. Um, and to only have two people left in my life that were willing to stand by me. I know what that looked like. So I think now that I have such fulfilling, loving, honest relationships, and I don't believe them to be my everything, but I think I always compare what I have now to what it looked like before. And I think I find fulfillment in that. So when I sit with you or when I sit with so-called big name people, it's amazing. I can honor it in the moment in time, but it in the grand scheme of things, I know that it doesn't mean anything. So I think I'm able to, I don't know. I, I think for me, I'm able to get fulfillment in very simple things because I always sort of compare it to the past. Um, so I'm able to kind of gratitude. It sounds like I'm talking about gratitude, essentially. I know what it looks like to not have. So in having, I'm so fucking thankful. Even being an immigrant, being from the country that I'm from, having a passport, a British passport that allows for me to travel when I'm from Zimbabwe, a country where it's so difficult to get from one town to another without having to bribe the police, yeah. you know? So I think I, I just look at... Um, yeah, I, I think getting sober and just falling so many times has forced me to value gratitude. And I think because of that, I don't, I'm not a seeker. I'm not constantly like more money, more sex, more opportunities. I'll do it. And I, I wonder if, and I wonder what you think about this. I think because I have a healthy detachment to a lot of these things, they all sort of just flow quite organically. Like I don't have to force for things to happen. Mm -hmm. Um so I don't have any kind of neat conclusion, but that's some of the stuff that was yeah. coming up as you were speaking. But your book, like you say, you talk about addiction, you've had the dark yeah. past, you've looked for that kind of gratification from the external things, mm -hmm. which was a negative, which was destroys your life, destroys your mental well-being, your soul, whatever people want to call it. But before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, yes. get more of a bit of understanding about you, Africa, where you grew up, how it all began. Yes. Um... So Africa, by the way, is my real name. What does that mean? As it says? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Is that yes. a meaning to it? Um, no, no, no. I, I say that because a lot of the time people will say, oh, is that your real name or is it? Um, so Africa is my name and I'm from, I'm from the African continent. I'm from Zimbabwe. That's where I was born and raised. And I was raised there until the age of nine. So I'm 31 now. So I have spent a bigger part of my life living here in the UK. But still, it's so interesting because when people ask me where I'm from, it's Zimbabwean first. I still speak my mother tongue, Shona, in my family home. It still feels very much like Zimbabwe. And I'm so thankful that my culture was preserved in that way in my family. But those nine years were very, very crucial because a lot of things were formed at that time. Um, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this already know that from the ages of zero to seven, so many imprints in terms of who you become as an adult happen. The way in which you connect with the world, the way in which you perceive love, some of your behavioral patterns, everything is sort of, you're just a sponge taking in everything. And for me, unfortunately, I grew up in a very abusive home. My dad was an alcoholic. And I always like to speak about this in a 
non-binary way. And in non-binary, I know we hear the term in a very different way in the context of gender and sexuality. But the reason why I advocate for non-binary thinking, just not trying to force things into good or bad, evil or right, right side, wrong side, whatever the fuck it might be, is because with my father, I really got to see the duality of being a human being. When he was drunk, he would be very abusive physically, not even just verbally or emotionally, physically abusive to my mother and to me and my siblings. I have two older sisters, one younger brother. Um, and I was a child at the time, you know. He could be an absolute monster, but he was also just the most charming, beautiful man. He was just Maxwell, that was his name. He's passed away now. But he was just a very quietly confident man, very reserved, didn't need to do so much, just be there in the room, but you can feel his presence. He was very magnetic as a person. Um, and he almost had like a sweet shyness to him a little bit. And even though I was a child, I can remember these things so clearly. I remember my dad being such a, even just a stylish, well-dressed man, and he was a teacher. Um, I, I talk about duality in this context because I only realize now in retrospect that it's where I learned the importance of holding multiple truths about people because he wasn't all bad, you know, but he wasn't all good either. He was a human being and he could be a monster, but he could also be a brilliant, attentive dad. Um, but the home was abusive, full stop. That's the reality of it. I think many people listening to this will resonate with growing up in a home that is just so chaotic, but it's all you know. So a lot of things were formed for me and cemented in the way that I love and relate to people. Um, but I also had a brilliant childhood in a lot of ways. Being raised in Zimbabwe, it is such a beautiful country with all its destruction and corruption and whatever else. It is so beautiful. We grew up playing outside, you know, climbing trees. You have so many kids around you. So even though there's all of this chaos within your home, there's so much outside of the home. You're not, you know, it's not like modern day society where you're glued to your iPads or your phones or, you know, people are scared to let their child walk to school, even if they're 10 years old. At five or six, we're walking to school by ourselves, you know. So there's a level of just independence and curiosity and playfulness that I had as a child. So my childhood, again, that duality, there was a darkness, but there was also so much joy and love in it as well. Um, and then when I was nine years old, we moved to the UK because Zimbabwe was on a very fast, rapid economic decline from being a country that was referred to as the bread basket of Africa because it was so rich in agriculture. Um, and because it was also colonized by Britain, it means that a lot of the things that British people had, we also had in Zimbabwe, even the architecture, the high level of education, the access to resources. Um, again, that duality, we've been colonized, but also we're being given a lot of incredible things and opportunities. But everything started to decline towards the late 90s, early 2000s. And my mother was a geologist at the time and my dad had lost work. And again, that made him even more um, resentful towards my mother because there was a lot of shame in that, in my mother being the breadwinner. So the abuse got worse because of the power dynamics shifting in the relationship and of course, that's something we didn't realize in that way as children, but I can speak to my mother now as an adult and she can share. But um, she had to think very fast about what she was going to do. Economically, things were very, very bad. Um, so she came to the UK. She worked very, very hard and she brought us over and my dad was supposed to follow later on, but his addiction got even worse and he ended up dying in Zimbabwe. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. And uh, you know what's crazy? Now, as a 31-year-old woman, I realize how young he was. He was only 43, you know. He was only 43 years old. And his decline with addiction was almost as rapid as the decline of Zimbabwe in and of itself, and just how quick it, it seemed. Um, but he ended up passing away. And my mother comes to the UK with 
three children, three <clears throat> very small children, and has to start from zero because all of her qualifications, everything that she had worked for, and she'd come from poverty, 10 siblings, absolute poverty in Gweru, which is the countryside in Zimbabwe. Um, but she had worked very hard to go to university, worked very hard to get into the space of uh, geology. And all of that meant absolutely nothing coming to the UK. All of those qualifications, none of it meant a fucking thing. She didn't have the connections to then move from mining into oil. Uh, she's not from wealth. She had to be a nurse. She had to be an adult nurse. And my mother's still a nurse now. Two two decades, 25 years in, and she actually really enjoys it now, you know, but I can only imagine just the, um, maybe I, I don't want to place the language of shame onto her. Maybe it's a projection on my own part, but just the emotional regression she must have felt, you know, having to start all over again and studying nursing, staying in student halls. I remember she was going to Ealing um, college and we would go there, would stay in her little room. This was in 2002 and three. Um, but she just made it feel like it was an absolute palace. We were never made to feel like victims, which is also why I strongly push back on victimhood and then sort of wearing victimhood as a badge of honor. Who is the most oppressed? Maybe that's also projection on my part, because even though we were living in actual adversity, not like superficial pretend adversity. We were never made to feel like victims, not because of our race, not because of money, not because of anything. My mother was not in denial about the reality of the life that we were living at the time. Um, but she, she never, she never made us think or even entertain the idea that we were less, you know. Um, and then from the age of, so this was nine years old, nine, 10, 11. How were you when your dad died with the love-hate relationship? I was, um, so he passed away in 2004. He passed away in 2004, so I would have been... 10? Yeah, exactly. No, no, I would have been Eight. maybe 12, 11, 12. Um, and you know what's so interesting in that moment, and it sort of ties into everything that I was just sharing now, I remember my mum coming to tell me and my siblings that he'd passed away. And she tells us, your father has died. She didn't go into the specifics because this ended up being a pattern of sort of avoiding the specifics. So I became quite avoidant as an adult, never kind of really going into detail of things, sort of withholding information. And I realized that my mother had to do a lot of that to protect us. But I remember when she came in to tell us he'd passed away, and I remember my siblings were crying and I just, I just couldn't cry. I just couldn't, I couldn't feel anything. But I realized that the only thing that I did feel genuinely was relief. I was so happy. I was so happy that he was dead. I was so happy that he was gone. I was so happy that, um, my mum didn't need to have a black eye anymore. She didn't need to be beaten up anymore. We were never going to be beaten up again, you know. And I remember feeling, it was like this, this little quiet joy that I was holding inside myself. And at the same time, intellectually, I was sad that my dad is gone. So it's, it's that pattern of duality, of experiencing contradictory emotions at the same time. So much relief that your parent has finally died, you know, but also feeling a sadness that is only sort of stuck in the mind and doesn't quite filter down into the body. Um, so my, I'm, I'm really thankful for my environment because I realize now that it forced me very lovingly and brutally sometimes forced me to honor and to see the just the non-duality of life just how multi-layered and contradictory all of it is um and then a few years later I started drinking 14 14 years old I started drinking and again it's it's seen as a cultural thing it's just a rite of passage just something you do you know but from the very first time, James, it was, there was this sense of just 
ultimate freedom that I had felt that I had never, ever felt before. There was nothing, to this day, there's nothing that compares to the freedom that I felt the first time that I drank. There was just like a relaxing of not even just the mind, like the physical response that my body had, just like a rela immediate relaxing of the shoulders, like a sort of um, mouth watering, like a full sensory arousing experience and not even arousing in a sexual way, just like an arousing, like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm alive. I get to feel this level of aliveness at such a young age, 14, and blacked out the very first time that I drank. And that was the pattern that followed me until I got sober 10 years on. I would black out pretty much every single time. And if I didn't black out, it would feel like absolute torture to have one drink. And I know that a lot of people listening to this can resonate. It didn't matter where I was, whether I was at a baby shower, at a work event, at a work meeting and drinks were a part of it, or um, just having breakfast with a friend. As long as I had one drink, my mind is immediately thinking about the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, another bottle, another one, where are we going to after this? And then is there going to be Coke and some kind of drugs? That came later in my teenage years. Um, but again, a, a specific anchor was put into place from the very first time that I drank. So I was a blackout binge drinker for a decade from 14 to 24 and realized, and we will probably explore this further, but I, I was able to realize maybe at 19 that I was following my father's exact pattern. But now it was just happening in a different environment um, in a different timeline, but it was so similar, scaringly similar. Um, so that was how my relationship with alcohol was formed. And Did how you it, get angry when you were drunk? No. <clears throat> so you no. never followed the, the same footsteps? It's funny because you'll probably see the, the photo with the father and the twins. The father's an alcoholic. He's got two sons. One goes down the same route as the father. has been an alcoholic, abusive, mm. hating life. And the other son goes a total opposite, becomes successful, fit and healthy because he's right. seen what his father was and didn't want to become it. And the other son became his father. How did you then mm. look at your father being abusive, beating you, beating your mum, being an alcoholic to then follow the same footsteps? Why did you have that attraction and gravitate towards it when you know mm. the life it could take you towards when you do it? Yeah. It's, um, and no, I hadn't seen mm. that uh, photo actually or that reference, but it makes perfect sense because my siblings, my two older sisters, and we're all so close. We have such a wonderful relationship now, thanks to me getting sober, because it wasn't always like that. Um, they took the path of rejecting alcohol completely, or at least really having a non-existent relationship with it, of it kind of really shocking them to the core and saying, I will never be this again. And for me... I, there was never really anything conscious about it. It's not as if I said, I am going to follow this pattern or because I have seen alcohol in my life in this way, I'm curious to try it. It all happened pretty organically. And I think um, my environment was a big contribution to that. And by that, I mean, to have this conversation in its fullness, we also have to honor the drinking culture here in the UK of what it looks like. I mentioned the words rite of passage because it is seen as a rite of passage, that it's normal for preteens and teenagers to start drinking in the park. I don't know whether kids do that now anymore. The, stat, the, stat, I think the, the stats now are young girls are drinking and vaping more than the young boys now. Really? Yeah, in the UK. The UK has got one of the worst rates in the world. I bet there's more drugs too. Yeah. That they're probably drinking. Young girls less. are doing it more than the Gosh. boys. It's flipped. Yeah. And it's And there's definitely something missing with that <coughs> fear. When I drank, we started drinking at twelve. I used to get a half mm. bottle of buck fast and two hooch. And I was playing football at the time. But you're fit and healthy and it doesn't take effect. I love the freedom of it. Yes. It took away my pain. It made me happier. It made me a better person. People wanted to spend time with me because I was fun. It gave me courage. It mm. gave me confidence. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the damage it does later on in life. And you'll tend to see people who drink at that age really suffer. Yes. Suffer in relationships, suffer with themselves, mental health, suicide. Anybody who I drank with at that age, majority of them are dead or in prison. Gosh. So see, when you were drinking and, and slipping, 
did, were you not? What was your mum saying? Did she say the see the telltale signs, or was she oblivious mm. to it? Because she must have seen when your dad was drinking. So to then see you doing it, she would have seen probably straight away that you were like your dad. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But again, <clears throat> because of the there's a general avoidance, right? You don't want to you want to avoid conflict, and I can understand. I I really get to see it so clearly now as an adult with my own life experiences, with my own adversity, with my own whatever the things are, fill in the blanks, right? I get to understand it now. Because my mum had to deal with so much, not even just physical, but emotional, spiritual, mental abuse, she couldn't, she wasn't in an environment where she could approach conflict in a healthy way. She wasn't in a relationship with a man that knew how to repair, that knew how to communicate effectively. So she had to hold everything in because conflict actually did mean abuse. Conflict actually meant punishment. Raising a concern or stating your needs or saying, I'm not happy with this, or I want to do things a different way could result in really severe punishment. So I can understand why even when she was noticing, because she was noticing my patterns, she didn't confront it directly because she didn't know how to speak to me. Because of all of those years of her relationship with my father, me and my siblings didn't really get the um, emotional nurturing that we needed. We had the physical safety. You better believe my mother made sure that we were safe and well and fed and clothed and went to school, etc. But there were so many other things that were of concern and priority. Emotions were not one of them. To talk about how we're feeling, to talk about, to even talk about the abuse that is happening in the home, it was not, it was not a thing. Things happen and you just pretend that nothing is happening at all. And then there's a cultural component to it as well, being Zimbabwean, being African, being from a religious culture where you're told to pray it away. You don't speak about your emotions and how you feel. You don't speak to your children in a certain way. You don't know how to either. But it's easier um, and safer for your mum yeah, not to speak because absolutely. if she opens her mouth, no matter if it's a positive, a slight burn in the, mm -hmm. the food or the dinner mm -hmm. can warrant a beating. 100%. Do you know what I'm saying? The slight movement or being loud or noise it warrants a beating for your father. Did you understand? Do you understand? Did you ever get to understand your dad's upbringing? Mm. Oh, that's such a good question. I do now. Once I let go of my hatred and resentment for him, I started to become more curious about his upbringing. So this would be in the past five years. And to your point, which does tie into this as well, you're absolutely right because she, even though she was now dealing with her daughter, who is not going to overpower her physically, that um, that sort of trauma, and that's not a word that I ever use, especially not lightly, but that's definitely what it was, an element of uh, PTSD, genuine PTSD, that even though now she's dealing with a child, it's a mirror image of her husband, of that person. So I'm still a threat in some way, yeah, if she was to point it out. Yeah. You see a horse in the stable, yeah. they can pretend to put a rope around the horse's neck and the horse doesn't move Gosh. because it's all in the fear of the mind of where it's doing it for so long consistently. They don't know if it's real or fake anymore. So even though she's in her shell, she's just too scared of the outcome of what could be yeah. because of what she's been yeah. through, whether it's you, a fucking slug or the smallest mm -hmm. person in the world or mm -hmm. whoever it is, she'd have still been scared to then mm -hmm. speak out because if you're 10, 20, 30 years of conditioning, Gosh. it doesn't just change overnight, you no, know? No, not at all. That James, that that's exactly it. And she's articulated that to me in different ways now because now we can speak about it, right? But it took a while. It took a while for her to even say anything because the result of not speaking naturally the what she's thinking in her mind is going to come through anyway so it would be silent treatment it would be passive aggressiveness maybe i wouldn't come home for a few days or for a week or whatever or i come home she can tell that i'm drunk or high or something i go up to my room whatever it is there's like a physical avoidance but there's also like an emotional and mental avoidance so the silent treatment we just don't speak and then maybe a few days later we'll just speak and then it'll be normal. And then the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. But because my addiction, again, was getting worse and worse and worse, there were points where I could 
hide my outside life and sort of coordinate my timing so that maybe she's on a night shift and then I come. So, so there was a sort of game. If your father you know? was around, do you think you would have drank? Oh, um, I've never been asked that question before. Um, because of the fear? They could have pushed you over the maybe, edge to do it anyway, yeah, but maybe you never had, have, your mum never had any fear over you, so maybe, you had a, a kind of, when my dad passed at 22, 23, my shackles were off, okay. so I used to go home after two or three days, because I knew my dad would phone, I always, mm. but once the shackles are off, the, the, and my mum was strict as well, she doesn't fuck around, but yes. it just never had the same effect as my dad's yes. presence, and eh, uh, when the shackles came off, then I didn't give a fuck. I didn't think I would make 30. Mm, no chance. Me too. Um, I just loved what I'd done. I loved the, the the sitting around and sitting with other losers. And not to bring them down, I was a loser I'm as well. You. But I'm with you. The pain was away. One. It was away. There was no pain. Not realising the pain's always going to be 100 times worse with the come down. But that's why I never really stopped. Yeah. Because it was such a good feeling to have a a camaraderie like just a brotherhood yes, and just yes, people yes. sitting talking shit the same kind of fuck ups the same normal people in society coming from mm -hmm. the, the painful broken homes or not educated enough to do well at school or yes. all the people who struggled and it was good to sit with everybody because you didn't feel alone I appreciate how you speak about um you this is why I say you really do embody the idea of the third perspective because I think we hear such singular stories of addiction where it's just about which is understandable right the the dark parts of it the things you hated about it the things that you know you regret etc and I I get it I get it I get it but I think it's also useful to be honest about what you got from it you know, which is why I, I can resonate with you so much in that I'm so grateful for that girl, that version of myself that went through all of that fuckery because you know what? There were there was so much freedom. It gave me a taste of freedom and allowed for me to see that actually I can create that freedom and sobriety. It's just gonna take a lot of fucking work. But I was able to even just dance in a carefree way and not feel self-conscious, kind of speak fluidly. Because I also wasn't the kind of drunk where, um, so I didn't get angry. You you said something earlier about kind of what kind of drunk was I? Did I get angry like my dad? But I really didn't. I really didn't. I did something else in that I could, because I, I had so much sexual shame because of my upbringing. My religious upbringing, specifically. What is your religious virginity? Um, 14. I was 13. 14, the first time that I drank. So, Were you drunk? Yes. So the association between sex and alcohol was created from a very young age. I could not have sex unless alcohol was involved until 25. So every single time. And I went through a very promiscuous stage when I was young. I would say from... 16 up until 19 specifically, 16 up until 20. So really think about that. Alcohol and sex became so tightly fused for me that I would feel so strange to try and even be intimate with someone without it. So I curated my life in a way where, especially when I got older and I had my own place and my partner and could have wine, you know, you start to dress up the addiction because if it's wine, it's better. If it's a nicer wine, blah, blah, blah. But all the stories curating the presentation but I the association between sex and alcohol was so so strong so I had a lot of sexual shame but it gave me that freedom where I didn't have to feel that shame it gave me that freedom where I felt like I could be so charming and just so free and sensual in my body and explore and be curious with no judgment and you know exactly as you're saying about the community aspect of it, I realized just how much joy I would experience actually when people would be sitting around a table and we're passing around the plate of cocaine and it feels like we're so close, like we're a little family, like it's such a beautiful moment. Like I never wanted to leave, ever wanted to leave because leaving meant going back to my normal life and I, I needed to stay. So I would just... 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, it, it's a I there's there's so it's much a weird, that I got. It's a weird thing to say and we don't want to glorify it, but no, we've no, got no, to no. be honest about it. You I, have I to laughed be. more in my twenties than I've ever done mm. because everything was a joke. Nothing was serious. I was a fuck up, but mm. I was surrounded by other fuck ups who didn't care either. Yes. But yes. obviously it's a mask of pain. You're hiding yes. from something. We get it now, but at that stage of Friday, everybody's ready because I knew if it was Friday, I used to feel good because I had three days. I would go home the Monday afternoon. People would go away at 3 a.m. Friday night, yeah. maybe Friday morning, maybe Saturday afternoon. I was ready to go again. And then Sunday, I loved. I had a new burst of energy. Mm -hmm. Super Sunday, we used to go down uh, the pub and just, it was another more beers and pints and gear. Yeah. And I just loved that. I loved that from the Friday night because I knew, okay, I've got three, four days with my friends yes. and then it was home time and then I was lonely, I was sad, I was depressed mm. um, and I knew how to make people fall in love with me. I was mm. gifted at that to then people. How did you do that? Because it, I, I became a showman. Right. I know how to make people laugh. Right. So that was that gift of becoming a clown. So people loved me. I, I was a bad gambler, so I gambled everything, but people used to fund me to be right. the clown, that guy, and just... There was there was an exchange of everything. I'll bring yeah. the last, you bring the coke. It was it was fucking right, strange. like transactional. Yeah, it's, yes, it, it was just yes. all losers together yeah. helping each other just get through whatever fuckery they're trying to deal with, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I fucking loved it. I just I knew, but I used to sit around at parties and think this ain't normal. But I never had the keys to unlock Gosh, the door. There was no. There was nobody I could look up to. There was no role models to say, what are you doing? Everybody done it. I, yes. I mean, where I'm from, everyone done yes. it. It was so sociably acceptable. Cocaine was just like fucking, it was just like drinking a beer. It became wow. so normalised and it just felt normal. And I felt as if the more popular you become, the, you're the one. I felt as if I was a popular one because I could snort the most coke or drink the most alcohol. Mm. I thought that was a gift. I thought that I was amazing Me because too. I was doing that. And, that's how fucking backwards my mind was. But it was to crave acceptance. Oh, James will do it. He'll do it. And I would right. fucking do it. I wasn't a violent man. All my other friends were violent. I was the clown. I would do daft yeah. shit though. If somebody yeah, yeah. wanted me to, I would fucking do it yeah. because it would create laughs and everybody would feel good. And it's just, it's mad how your mind can slip to that state mm. of uneducated towards life. But like I say, there was no role models. The men in the right. pubs, well, the exact same. They they would egg it on. Uh, they would all be in the same boat. There would be people from 18 years old to 65 snorting coke in the toilet. Wow. Fucking nuts. What about wow. Your dad's backstory. What's your dad's backstory? Yeah, he was... So I actually don't know much about it because, like I'm saying, I, I feel like um, I had to go through a period of releasing the hatred and resentment that I had of him to release the single story that I had. He was a bad, evil person, and this is who he was, full stop, always has been. So I was never really curious or wanted to know about his backstory. What was he like as a young boy? As a, I just had all of these heavy, charged feelings. And I think I did need to feel that. I did need to honor that part of me. Do you think that's easier to then go over a death when you hate someone? Because you Ooh. pretend that you're, it's okay, I didn't like him anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you block it out because it's yeah. clearly affected you most than anyone in your family, especially with the addictions. That's Massively. a cry out for help. The reason i done it because I was in pain. I didn't speak about my emotions. We spoke last night at dinner. I don't mm. become vulnerable. Yes, these interviews are kind of vulnerable. But I'm only speaking my story from what 90% the UK does. Right. My story is just the same as any other average kid who's trying to get by week working and then on it at the weekend. But then I made the changes, so then to then better it and not mm -hmm. be the same lost soul that I was. But yes. do you think it's easier to go over death if you hate? Oh, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And I again, I've never intuitively, as you say it, I'm like yes, but I've never consciously thought about it in that way. When my mother came in to tell us that he died, it was easier for me to process it because to me it was the evil was gone the bad was gone. And because my the way that I hated him and just resented him and just wanted to punish him, um, a memory comes up actually of when I was maybe six years old and him and my mother were out in the front yard in the veranda and he was dragging her, you know, and I was five, I was tiny. And I remember picking up this brick and I was throwing it at him. And it felt so big at the time because of how small I was, but I realized just how tiny and helpless I was in that moment. So fast forwarding to me being uh, 11 or 12, however old I was, where I felt much older, 
it felt like um, almost like in hating him, I was regaining a sense of control because of how helpless we were all made to feel by this man. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it allowed for me to deal with it. But then in order for me to actually feel truly secure and in integrity with my sobriety, I did have to forgive him. I had to humanize him again. So that's when I started becoming more curious about his life and his story. And even though I still don't know much, I now talk to his siblings and my mom and she tells me how she met him. You know, he was, I feel like I don't know much before he was 19 years old, but he was, actually he was 20. He was a teacher, he was 20 years old. My mother was 19, that's when they met. And they just hit it off straight away. He would walk her to the bus stop and she would take the bus back to the country where she lived. He was in Harare, the capital city. And he was a teacher and he was so intelligent and smart and just funny and they loved the same music. And Bob Marley was very big in Zimbabwe at the time. So they would go to concerts together. And my mum has never drunk a day in her life, ever. But she she had so much um, joy and a smile on her face when she would tell me these stories and how she would sneak in alcohol into the concerts when they were younger. And again, all of these stories that sort of humanize him, you know. And I speak to his siblings that tell me just how, again, just his wisdom and his heart and... Um, I'm still in that process of just learning more about him. So I can, I can no longer have the biggest sort of, um, if I think of the different files and storage units in my mind, a lot of it is bad. A lot of it is just abuse, abuse, and just a decline. And last memories I have of my father, because he started to become very ill because of how much he drank, he had a kidney condition. I remember going back to Harare to our family home after being in Gueru in the country for a while and then going into his bedroom and just seeing him in such a really sick state he'd lost so much weight and there were like bottles of urine everywhere in the room and it, it was like we were seeing him in such a degraded state and I I just I have more of that than I do the Maxwell who was, you know, wonderful and wise and a beautiful man. So I'm, I'm in the process now of humanizing him. And I, I think it's allowing for me to actually become even closer with my mum. And we're very close now. She's like one of my biggest, biggest supporters, cheerleaders. And she's so open, more open than I gave her credit for, you know. She's just someone that needs to be asked the questions. She won't volunteer information. And I realize now why she won't volunteer. She just needs to be asked. Where did she say it went wrong? Was there mm -hmm. any telltale signs when your dad started drinking heavily? Because all kids are born innocent. They're yeah. all born pure. Certain mm -hmm. circumstances, certain levels of trauma through life can trigger certain yeah. impulses to then escape from it yeah. whether that's drink sex yeah f fucking running 100 miles whatever it is is to hide from something so your dad mm. like you say is having good memories but if he was good at times as well it's easier to then remember the hate because it's easier to then numb the pain because if yeah. we're going to talk shit about the people who gave us hate in life we may as well mm. talk about the stuff that they've done also because like you say, there's good memories. There might not have been a lot of them, but he clearly had something in him where he wasn't abusive 24-7. It yeah, doesn't justify yeah, yeah. being abusive, but obviously that battle and pain that he was going through to become an alcoholic, there's something in that as well because all men feel shame. Oh, we all feel sure. as if we should be doing more. And like you say, for probably sure. became more abusive when your mum then became the breadwinner. Your sense of you're losing your fucking masculinity. Mm -hmm. They're taking full control and... Instead of men being men and trying going, okay, I'll up the ante, the majority of people hide from it and yeah. they become full of hate. Anger and rage is just it's just a it's a weakness yeah. because it makes us soft, it makes us fragile and like we speak about vulnerability, but it's the wrong vulnerability because mm. it's just then the addictions creep in because there's so much pain there. And it's yeah. difficult and like I say it's Addiction takes us to so many levels, but you became the yeah. same. When did you start taking drugs? Mm. 19. 
No, no, no. Much younger than that. Was it, 17. Was it weed first? 17. No, no, no. I, I never smoked weed. I tried weed a little bit, but I just couldn't do it. The paranoia just hit me instantly. I was not one of those people that took to it. The first drugs that I did were MDMA. Hmm. I think it was probably MDMA and um, just party drugs and pills. But I didn't, I preferred alcohol for whatever reason. I felt, I felt like I was in more control with alcohol or at least the illusion of it. You know, because when I would look in the mirror, at least my jaw wouldn't be swinging, my eyes wouldn't be. So there was kind of like a almost vanity on some level allowed me to not go into deeper, more grottier drugs. So I never did like hard, hard drugs. And I'm so grateful for that because my goodness, I wonder what path I would have walked if I had been introduced and accepted crack or meth or heroin. And I truly commend people that have been able to get sober from drugs like that and even cocaine at a at a sort of more regular level um but cocaine was sort of the go-to similar to you in that it was just it just became a side if you're drinking there's going to be some coke as well yeah. but i think culturally for me doing something like cocaine was a very big deal because culturally it was not I used to have this idea that black people don't do drugs. Like black people just do Because I never saw it, never heard it. Um, and when I say black people, I'm talking specifically African people, not North American, black Americans. Um, but I just, once it was introduced to me again, that level of freedom, like, oh my, you can feel like this in your body. Like that's fucking crazy. You know, you can feel so good. And then what was happening is that and I wonder if you had this too, James. I was giving alcohol and the drugs so much credit for characteristics that were actually innate in me and traits, even things like confidence, being able to speak with people properly, being able to be witty and charming and have a sense of humor, whatever it might be. I attributed all of those things to drugs and alcohol, which meant that when I was trying to get sober, that's why I relapsed so many times, I, I really didn't believe that I could do it without those things. I, I do understand that there was, um, because of alcohol and drugs, all of these mind altering things, they did allow for those things to come through in a different way. So I get that, but I just gave it way too much credit. I didn't believe that I could be even a remotely well-rounded human being without those things. But I actually realized, and I know retrospect is a gift, but I realize now that they were they were actually um, diminishing all those characteristics and traits. And I, I'm curious to know if you ever experienced that. All of those things, again, being the life of the party, whatever else, things that you might call a performance, were there sort of useful characteristics that you were giving alcohol and drugs credit for that you realize now actually i'm just innately this yeah, person because it, raise, it raises your confidence and lowers your anxiety yeah. of yes. course people drink yes. as like but i became a circus act and then mm. i didn't know when to switch off because i've done stand-up comedy before and every comedian right. i know is kind of they struggle more than anyone on this planet every comedian because it's mm -hmm. a false persona of trying to be funny all the time it's not natural to be funny all the time but it's trying to get you're trying to get acceptance from people that you're a good person or they want to be with you. My way of getting in with everybody was being the funny guy, right. being the daft guy, being the life and soul of the party. Because if I never had that, I had nothing else because I never had any money. I'd done a lot of bad shit, but my money was going into the bookies. I hated drinking. I just loved the way it made me feel. Right. I love Coke. Yeah. I love taking Coke. Look, we would have a sip of beer and then it's straight on to the Charlie. There was no getting six beers, ten beers. I just loved mm. the extra feeling. But then... It ends up becoming fun, but after three years, five years, the fun then becomes darkness. And then before you know it, the Valium slips in and then the weed slips in. Yes. And then you're never in a conscious state any day of the week. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's okay for Friday to Sunday, you're young, but it eats away at something. The yeah. soul, the mindset, your appearance, you start becoming a little grey. But I always wore suits and had sunbeds, so I always kind of had it well. Mm. I used to look at maybe people on heroin and I think junkies look at the state of them. I'm not that bad. I would make them, I would put them in a lower pedestal because I was not like them. So it made me feel okay. 
know what I'm saying? I wasn't crack either, heroin, because people used to smoke it at parties and shit. I used to think, okay. fuck that. You could because I knew the damage it done with their teeth and their skin. Mm -hmm. And I was so vain of I've still got it. So because I could still get a good looking bird, it never felt as if I was bad because I had it better, because I can still get a girlfriend or I can still pull the wheel over people's eyes. It was just all a big charade. I was in fucking pain. Mm. But who are you going to speak to at that age? You can't speak to no one. No one. No one. No one. And if you're They'll tell you to shut up. Yeah, exactly. And if you're anything like me, where I curated my life so intentionally that everyone around me was doing the same thing. So I, I didn't know a single person that was sober, unless they were a family member, but that was like a no-go area. Um, but I resonate with that so much in a different way in becoming a performance. Because for me, I started to wear the kind of party girl persona, but not like your typical archetypal party girl, you know. But it was just like this thing of, if Africa's here, you know you're going to have a good night because mm -hmm. she's willing to just go, 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 go. And because I was never sloppy in anything that I did, I felt this just egoic illusion of being together and I have everything under control. But when I look at it now, I realize that it was it, it was actually just so sad because it was just that a performance performing That's what it is. that a one hundred conductor performing yeah. the charm, performing the thing when you know the reality of your life and the the truth in this too. And I know it's the same for you. When you look a certain way, if you're objectively attractive, it's difficult for people to truly understand that you have a problem or to call it out or to truly recognize it mm -hmm. because it's packaged so well you don't look like the junkie you don't look like the alcoholic people have this really just vapid idea and i understand it because it's it's been pumped into us through film and branding and marketing that an addict look like this if you look like this then you can't possibly be an addict so i think i was able to really go under the radar for a very long time yeah. because of that well-curated yeah. outer shell. Because you know? people say, yeah, it looks okay, but it's internally the pain. Man. And you become the puppet master because I was always putting out the lines or I was always mm. controlling the music. I was, <laughs> yeah. yes, I was orchestrating the full party for three, four days. People would slip me away. Too. I need to go home for work. I never had work. I never had fuck all. So I used to go longer and I would say, and then I would try and, okay, maybe you need a line to sober up or um, mm. don't go home. I used to break me my too. heart when people left. Me At the too. start of the party, maybe 20 people at the house party. By the end of it, there's two or three, always the same stragglers. And I was always the last one to leave. And then I would go home sad. People were back at the gym on Monday or back to work. I just wanted Friday to come again or Thursday. Yeah. I wanted some, even as sad as it is, a funeral or a party or a wedding because something. I had something to go and get fucked up with. Yeah. Always knew a funeral was perfect because people were grieving mm. and they didn't want to go home they wanted party more yes. so i used that and manipulated that to you could be dead tomorrow let's just get fucked up right fucking mad method of thinking is madness everything was manipulation i could get people to leave their job leave their partners to stay out for that weekend because i would get in their mind mm. there's people doing 30 years in prison you're worried about a hangover people are dying mm. there's people in hospital dying and you'd want to go hey and fucking live for the now all that yolo bullshit yeah. i was that guy to yeah. get people up for it fuck it you're right i don't know how many relationships i've ended by keeping uh, my best friends out of my friends because they never went home after three four days i'm thinking fuck her and they're going, yeah, yeah, you're right. I was like, don't ever get told. And I'm manipulating them to stay out with me because I had nobody. It's fucking That's mad. That's insane how much I can resonate with that at different degrees because getting sober showed me, which is why I think it's so fucking important to really just do not like surface level self-help, self-reflection, like just grueling self-reflection and self-scrutiny to really understand your shadow and the things that we're talking about here. It's so easy for someone listening or whatever to start making assumptions, to make judgments about who I am, about who you are, about who we still might be. But I just invite people to be curious about how they have these similar things we're talking about, those manipulative parts of you, the compulsive pathological lying parts of you, Another thing that would happen for me, and I wonder what your experience, if you had one with this, was cheating. I, I didn't know how to be faithful in relationships. I would cheat in every relationship that I was in up until I got sober. 
every single one. The self-sabotage was just so profound. And the more that someone loved me and the more that someone cared about me, the more that there was this compulsion to just fuck it up. Because the fear was that if you were to truly love me and get to know me, you will see me for who I really am. And you're going to leave anyway. You're going to abandon me anyway. Mm -hmm. So I need to abandon ship now. I need to puncture holes in this ship so it can sink before you make it sink. That was my thinking yeah. with everything. But I think as everything. you say, it, it becomes an abandonment because what yeah. happens is the main father figure in your life passed away and left you. So you never had that guidance of having that strong masculine energy mm -hmm. there to protect you so every relationship never got past three months with me because everything mm -hmm. that good that came into my life never lasted and the pain of it was just too much so it's easier to then end the relationship find flaws the toes too big or the finger mm -hmm. or the eyebrow i'd find a flaw so if she said something out of line i'm done anyway i don't like your fucking eyebrows so i would create things like me. a little package of negatives about these person so it would be easier to fuck them off and just move on to the next. There was everything was meaningless. There was no connection. It was just more of what can I get from them? Yeah. What can I use them for? Everything was just use. Everything was just manipulation to then get me through. But I would end it all. And part of that still lasts now in relationships that I'm in. Or there's part of me thinking, am I using them now? I'm trying to dress right. it all up in my mind because I don't want to be that character. I yeah. try to be as honest as i can be yes. but we're all still we've still got those tactics that's why we get through life because there's still an element of all the fuckery that we've used yeah. to then kick us on now but every relationship was doomed because i always seen flaws and i never loved myself so i would make sure i'm very good at making people fall in love with me mm. but i'm also good at breaking their fucking heart mm. because i was never ready but i would tell them that i was ready i would hit them with all the same bullshit that i would tell my friends to do to stay out for an extra day or two it's all manipulation. Gosh. It's um it's why when I got sober, that there really was a rude awakening because I thought stopping the drugs and the drinking would make it all go away. That I, I wouldn't cheat anymore, I wouldn't lie anymore, I wouldn't manipulate, whatever it is, whatever it is. But like I was saying earlier, I really got to see that, oh shit, okay. So this is where the, the work actually begins. Because for me now, I, I share those things with partners. I'm, I'm very honest in a way that feels appropriate. But you, you think know? that's enough? So I do the same, but I feel as if that's another form of manipulation. See, to accept us for who is am. And no, no, no. You, no it, but seeing you start speaking out against that, you realize you're not alone. But then the more you speak out, the note people can relate as well it's yeah but but i think i i don't do it in a way where i say this is just something that i i am full stop because i actually don't believe that i am those things anymore and i i've had to take so much accountability again in a very excruciating way i haven't fucked around with my recovery i haven't just stopped drinking i've been in therapy Therapy, I had to stop because I realized that I didn't want that to be a crutch. There are so many things that I need to figure out myself and truly understand and really own up to, and it takes time. I'm not in a rush to fix any of these things. But when I realized that I, I started compulsive lying from such a young age, because again, I couldn't tell the truth in the environment that I was raised in. But then when I started to see just the power that you get from lying to someone and you get away with it. That's kind of what I got addicted to at a very young age. And it would rear its head in a big way when I was drunk or high. Again, the performance, um, embellishing things. Did you ever do that as well? Embellishing stories and elaborate things, Talk kind of show, yeah. over inflating, whatever. Because yeah. again, it made me feel like even if I'm lying, as long as this person believes it in this moment, it, it, it was giving me something, right? All of these things, again, relapsing seven times. And when I say relapsing, I really want people to know that I'm not just talking about saying, um, I'm never drinking again because I've had a really fucking bad hangover. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about hitting rock bottom and then saying, I'm going to try again. Getting sober for three months, six months, seven months, five months, four months, two months, and pulling the plug every single time that I actually started to feel well because I didn't think I deserved it. So 
all of those things that I was and experienced, the compulsive lying, the manipulation, etc., I know that they are things that will always exist because we we all have the capacity to do it. Just get us in the right environment or traumatize us with the right thing. We all can activate those things. They're not exclusive to me or you or to anyone listening. We all fucking have them, whether we like it or not. Because I know my shadow and accept it well, I don't use it as an excuse. I know how to work with it. So in manipulating, for example, which has a negative connotation to it, right? And I get it because manipulating is seen as kind of um, warping even someone's self-perception, someone's decision-making to suit your own benefit. But we do it all the time. We're in constant negotiation with each other. So it's kind of like... um, like a superhero sort of analogy. I'm learning how to use my powers for good. And I've been in training to use my powers for good. Manipulation in the way that we sort of see it can work in terms of when I'm trying to have an effective conversation with someone, trying to help someone see something, even if it's for themselves. So it's useful even in the work that I do as a developmental coach, as a consultant, getting people to change in, in the way that they think. So I'm 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 learning to understand that I'm actually not bound to all of those things. That's what I write about in the book, to realize that if you've fucked up, and I know that a lot of people listening to this have, they've done things that they regret, things that they will never share with anyone else. Sure, you still have the capacity to do that again. And also you're not bound to that forever. So I I don't actually believe um, that once you've manipulated, you will be that for the rest of your life. I think you will have to make a very conscious effort to go against that conditioning in each moment and to choose just brutal honesty, you know, with yourself and other people. I tell partners that sometimes, I don't have that as much anymore, I can have a tendency to fault find, similar to you. Once someone is starting to become close, I just start to notice just little tiny insignificant things that don't mean a fucking thing in the grand scheme of things. But because it's, it's, and it was, because it's really changed drastically in the past couple of years, it was like an inability to truly receive love because I didn't think I deserved it. So it was a self-esteem worthiness issue, but I would make the other person the issue, you know, it's something within them, the way that they talk or the way that they are or this little thing. All I knew was to walk away never repair, never to actually honor someone's imperfections. Because I I never thought that someone would ever honor mine to just a constant projection. But it did actually help when I would start to tell partners, you know what, I have a tendency to do this and I don't want to do that with you. So I'm going to call myself out when I notice myself doing that. In conflict, I know that my instinct, which I go against a lot, even in my work, is to shut down, especially in romantic relationships. If there's conflict, it's to shut down or get defensive. But I notice it. I've trained myself to notice it just as quickly and change my behavior. So I'm constantly working at reprogramming myself. And you can absolutely do, it's not going to happen overnight. It's just not going to fucking happen. But it's it's in those micro interactions where it's easier to lie. I choose to tell the truth even though I know that a part of me would still feel an arousal and satisfaction in lying, I know what the long term will look like. It means that you and I are not actually intimate at all. So I'm doing the same shit that I was doing when I was drinking, but I'm just doing it in a different way now. And I I just refuse to do that. So I find that owning up to my shit, not in a, this is just who I am way, but in a, I'm going to call myself out when I notice myself doing this. And if you notice it in me, please call me out on it only thing is though a lot of partners like i'll be honest about it as well but not a lot of people are understanding enough for each other's feelings and emotions and who they are it's easier to walk away we're living in a society now where instagram's a dating app we get fucking so many other dating apps that you can use everything's connection with people who you who can easily get people can easily get connected to anybody on this planet just by typing in their name and i feel as if nobody works at anything and is honest with herself because it's easy just to move on it's easier it's safer Mm -hmm. i don't need to put up with that shit she's a fucking psycho Mm -hmm. i'm a psycho everybody's a psycho everybody's crazy to a, a degree but when you've got upbringings and other understandings and levels of trauma and if people can be upfront about it like i say that's a strength mm-hmm. but nobody 
it's for people to understand that it's easy to love somebody for their good points but it's about accepting them for their yeah. bad which we don't do because we think she's fucking crazy yeah it's easier to think somebody's crazy because then you can just fuck them off and move on to the next but isn't that um because i understand what you mean but maybe i can lovingly call you out in this moment because you're saying nobody which is a very absolutist way of saying it because that's not true it's some people might be but there are they're actually do you think then it's about who you select because there's so many people out there that are open but sometimes and this is where again the now is the conversation about calling out because i had to call myself out on this i had the story because there's so many fucking stories we have I had the story that other people are not open enough or patient enough or understanding enough. But again, it, it was almost like an excuse to keep people at bay that everyone's like this. I know what people are, that when it's not actually true, where I just wasn't choosing the people that were open enough. So I, 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 I think sometimes the absolutist language, which is the whole idea of the third perspective, to really understand that actually... Maybe it's just because who of who I have chosen up until now, because I was choosing people that were also conflict avoidant. I was making very specific choices that were just written for me because of my historical context and my life. But I, I wasn't allowing myself to choose intentionally, to choose and to screen people properly, to have the patience to allow for people to grow, to not expect people to be perfect, to not expect people to have every single thing figured out because I hold myself to all of these standards. So I think I, I'm in agreement with what you're saying completely. And I think there's room to not make a blanket assumption of what people are like. Because I, I remember doing that so much myself and I, I think that acted as a form of self-sabotage yeah. in an office because it i was reinforcing the story you mm -hmm. know instead of looking at it differently yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. totally understand yeah when did you realize that everything was a mess when did you realize that mm. you were so lost and so fake that you were pretending your whole way through it when was that Gosh. kind of moment where you realized something needs to change 19 five years before i got sober I was still very young. Yeah. I was 30, 29 okay. actually. And you know what? It wasn't a... Because <sighs> I, I think sometimes people think it's it's one moment. You kind of have mm -hmm. one big moment. It wasn't like that. It was like a collection of different moments of just feeling, again, that thing you're talking about, the juxtaposition of being at a party, a gathering, and you have the attention of everyone, you're working the room, whatever, doing your bullshit, doing whatever yeah. it is. And then the very next day or a few days later, going back to the reality of your life when no one is speaking to you, no one calls you in the daytime, you don't see people in the daytime, you only see people at night, where there's no intimacy, where there's always this constant feeling of I've fucked up and I've done something, there's something that I need to apologize for, but I... I was I I was so fucked up and blacked out that I can't even remember what it is. So the the I spent most of my life actually from 19 with just an overhanging shame and a sense of dread, you know. But again, I can go and party it away and dress up and blah blah blah. Um so 19 was when I started to get this thing of okay, so something is not quite right here. And I think at 19 is also when my mum, for the first time ever, first and last time, she said to me, you remind me of your dad. So yeah, it, it was my own internal awareness and because of what was happening around me externally, but also my mum, who was very conflict avoidant because she'd been holding it in for five years up until this time. Um, well, I remember I had been dropped home by the police at around three in the morning um, because I had, I can't remember exactly what had happened, but I had taken a taxi, I think from Surrey back to London where I live and I couldn't pay for it. I was so fucked up, couldn't pay for it. And I have no, I guess I'd charmed the driver to, to, take me 
And at some point halfway in the journey, the driver had realized that I didn't have any money. So he'd called the police and then the police escorted me home. Um, and I remember my mum, who was starting her nursing shift seven in the morning. So she would have needed to be up at six, opening the door at 3 a.m., taking me in. She didn't shout anything like that. She didn't, because again, she was used to this, just different versions of the same thing. Um, and then she told me in that moment that I, I remind her exactly of my dad. Um, and then she just went upstairs to bed and we never spoke about it again. Um, so yeah, 19 was when it started to become quiet. Um, Why did those words hurt you? I don't know that they hurt. They, like hit you? I couldn't, it, feel, it, I couldn't feel anything at the time. You know that thing where numb for years? you understand what mm -hmm. someone's saying intellectually and you understand that you're supposed to be upset in this moment, but it's not mm -hmm. reaching your heart. Mm -hmm. It only reached years on once I got sober and I was able to go back and be like, ah, I get it. When did you go to therapy? Therapy was 2017. So I was a year into sobriety at the time. So I didn't, um, I didn't take a therapeutic approach to get sober. Cause again, I'm not from an environment or a culture or a home where there's rehab, there's therapy, there's like recovery support. No, you go to fucking church or you shut up. That's it. I always speak about That's it. it. <laughs> when your change is the hardest thing ever because the conscience then heightens and yeah. you remember and it remembers you all the shit that you've done, yeah. all the things that you've said, all the mistakes that you've made that fucking comes to the surface. And that's why people don't push through the change mm -hmm. because it reminds them who they are. And when you start making changes, it also reminds them who they can be. Mm -hmm. But there's so much pressure on that. There's more pressure being sober because you know, and the mm -hmm. sad thing is that people's potential, no matter what age you are, the potential that people have is so great and yet we're so dumbed down to think that we'll never amount to anything, we'll never be anything, we'll always be this fuck up mm -hmm. with the self-sabotage, the self-loathing, the not feeling good enough, and the, never the fitting in. The imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome that. People need to realise that they've got greatness. People need to realise that if you do make certain choices, make better choices, make healthier choices, and you can then guide your ship to wherever you want to take it, whatever yeah. destination you want to go. And it's so important for people to realise they've all got greatness in them. And never, you see people and you speak to people and you think, do you, I don't think you realise the potential mm. that you have. Everybody's got the potential to be anything they want to be, but we're yet so controlled, so conditioned to a system that we don't feel good enough. We always feel empty. We always feel as if we don't fit in. And that's the sad reality. But if you can keep making the changes, then people can, you can hopefully leave a, br a blueprint for people to then, if he can do it, I can do it. I agree. I agree. And it's also why, you know, fast forwarding nearly a decade from everything that we're sharing now, where my, my work and what I do in the world has just so organically led me to just explore what it means to change as a human being, the power of true change. And I know that we hear words like change, authenticity, and they've just been so, uh, so sort of branded and marketed to almost lose their meaning, but it means fucking something for a human being to change from one way of being to another. And again, I think because of the culture that we're creating now where we, we bound people to their past mistakes, it's almost like because we don't believe that we can change. We refuse to believe that other people get to change. We refuse to believe that people get to have a different opinion and then they can change their mind about that opinion. Say, actually, I don't agree with that anymore. I don't feel that way anymore. I'm not the same person that I was a year ago, two years ago, whatever the fuck it is. And my, my own personal journey of getting sober, having to hold so many contradictions about myself and the world around me, has allowed for me to start looking at things on a more cultural level to be, to really pose the question, can we truly understand and honor other people's contradictions and mess if we can't own our own, you know? Um, but you're, you're so right. I think we have, and again, potential is one of those words we hear all the time too. Mm. And we're like, what the fuck does it actually mean? You know, but yeah. innately <clears throat> we know it. And it's such a shame when a person doesn't allow for themselves to truly experience what it looks like to live fully in whatever it is they want to do. And it doesn't have to be something in the public eye. 
or something that has these external metrics metrics of success like followers, money, a certain type of house, lifestyle. I think it's more of a deeply innate thing. What what would it look like for me to be truly free, you know? I just dare people to even explore that question. What would it actually look like if you were truly free within yourself? What what could that look like? Because to me that speaks to the whole conversation of potential. But if alcohol and drugs and vices, even porn, gambling addiction, because porn was another thing for me too, from the age of 10, I I think you'll never really get to meet yourself fully. You just won't. You, you might get close, you might meet fragments of yourself, but as long as you're not sitting in that discomfort of being like, who the fuck am I without any of these things? What does it look like for me to be free? you will never in this lifetime meet yourself no, properly. But it's no. different because porn, alcohol, drugs, gambling, overeating, sugars, yeah. it's all a poison there for the mind. And mm -hmm. it, it's difficult for people to eliminate them. The thing I struggle with now is food. I mm. eat my emotions, but I will master that. I believe I'll hit my peak in my 40s and 50s. I believe I will. Everything will make sense and I'll lead by example. Right. But when people are full of alcohol and porn and sex and it feels good at that moment to mm. get by and through their pain. Mm. I understand it, but I you'll never get it. to your true source by dabbling in the negatives in life. The destruction that porn does to young minds, male and female Gosh. now, the destruction of alcohol to the minds of anybody on this planet, destruction of drugs, cigarettes, even coffees. I know people who take four, five, six coffees a day. Mm. It's taking them away from a conscience frame. They're never going to see their true source and true potential by doing the external things. And mm. again, we can only try and be the best version of us to try and leave the clues or the tools and techniques Great. for people to see it. Why did you relapse so many times? Seven times, mm -hmm. is it? Seven times. Seven times from the age of 19 up until 24. I relapsed and I was sharing a little bit about this with you at dinner yesterday in that for me it's interesting because I didn't, I didn't relapse because I missed alcohol or because I missed getting fucked up. That was a part of it. And that was true on some level. I did miss parting. I missed the freedom. I missed feeling just so in my body because drugs took me out of the mind and brought me just fully into the body. So I missed that for sure. But I relapsed so many times because I was so uncomfortable with things going well. I was so uncomfortable with living a chaos-free life. For, for the most formative years of my life, I had been used to my father's chaos, the chaos in our environment. I got to know it very, very well for most of my life. Got to learn how to manipulate in that environment. Got to learn how to lie, how to navigate things, how to leave home, go to school, tell everyone my father was brilliant. He was amazing. Kind of get to create stories about, about that part. But there was a lot of chaos. But we knew how to deal with it. We knew how to deal with the chaos. And then from 14 onwards, I was creating my own personal chaos. There was a freedom a liberation and elation, blah, 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 all of these things. Um, but it was chaotic because the bubble that I was in when I was high or drunk didn't connect or resonate with the real world. Because in the real world, you need to be on time. You need to be responsible. You need to be honest with the people around you. You need to show up. You need to be home you're a child, you need to, you know, there's a completely different reality to the one I created. So it was chaos. So in getting sober, suddenly there was no, you know, that adrenaline of knowing that you fucked up and knowing that you're going to have to go on this quest to kind of resolve things and fix things. And, you know, Maybe it's might be for you kind of borrowing money. You have no idea how you're going to fucking do it, but there's something in you that's like, I, I know how to do it. I know where to go. I know who to speak to. I know they'll believe me. I know they'll lend me. You, you kind of know how to fix or maneuver in the chaos. I didn't have that anymore. Suddenly I was the version of Africa that shows up to work on time or at least has no excuse to be late anymore because I'm not hungover. I haven't forgotten what I needed to do or that I'm even working, just all of these things, you know. Um, I show up to work on time. I'm not lying to people because now I can feel, I'm not numb, I can feel. So I actually feel bad and I feel guilty for lying to my partner. 
I am not cheating in my relationships. I can feel an attraction to someone, but I'm honoring the love that I have with this person. I am having more friends around me. They're proud of me that I've been sober for a month or two or five or six or seven, which was the longest. Um, it all just felt so uncomfortable. It was not stimulating. It was not, um, even when it was fun, it felt uncomfortable because it felt like, fun for me was associated with alcohol. Sex for me was associated with alcohol. Friendship, alcohol, gathering, alcohol, everything was associated with alcohol. So not having it, it felt like all of these things were not actually real. Um, so I relapsed because of that, because the chaos was just much easier. I knew it. I knew how to apologize. I knew how to, um, get ready for a night and already feel in my bones that I'm going to black out for a while, but it's still quite exciting and fun because I have no fucking idea what might happen. End up in the most random, brilliant places. You have no idea where you're going to end up. I was more used to that. So that's why I relapsed. The chaos was just much more, um, much more compelling mm -hmm. and familiar. Yeah, I'd done four months relapsed, nine months relapsed, two really? years relapsed. And this is the longest, two six years. years. Yeah. I come back from Ants for a row and I thought, have a vodka. You know, it's what, just a, like a celebration. You're celebrating through fucking misery, but I had a drink and I went missing for a year, full fucking wow. year. I had a, my first ever job, James. personal trainer, first ever job. Within that job, this is the power of change. Within that job, within six weeks, this was my first ever proper job. Within six weeks, I was head PT in charge of other oh, 20 wow. personal trainers because I had that presence mm -hmm. of speaking to old Tom who was on the bike, who maybe 60 mm -hmm. years old, asking how his kids was, how his dog was. I built connections in the gym with being everybody's friend. Yes. Part of those manipulation tactics that I had at parties and getting through life, I kind of embedded them all to exactly. then do it in a positive exactly. way. So when people exactly. needed PT, they would come to me because they'd build up a rapport and a trust of, I like him. So I, I was shit at personal training, but what I could do is make people feel good more than anybody. People would leave on a fucking high because of the information and knowledge of change that I'd gathered and people just felt amazing. I had to cheat my way through the test. It was an intense personal training course. Six weeks, my, my personal training course was called Mind, Body and Fitness or Mind, Body and Health uh -huh. and uh, Head PT. Other personal trainers were going for the head PT wow. role. I went and Charlene Cooper, I love her to bits, still friends. And uh, I fucking became in charge of 20 other people. Wow. Six weeks in the job. Never had a clue what the fuck I was doing. People were doing it for 20 years. I wasn't in the best shape either. But what I did is have the mindset of making people, I had a friendship. Yes. People were coming in, not like a therapy, but they were understanding life of just eliminating the things. But the thing about change as well, I became a preacher at the start. Everybody had stopped drinking, everybody stopped doing this. <laughs> Me too. Because it's, I just know how good I was feeling. I wanted yeah. other people to feel yeah. that natural high. And yeah, I ended up fucking it. Um, end up back on the gear, the gambling. That when you do open the door for one negative, mm. they all seeped in. Mm. They all come hand in hand. I it couldn't just do it. one. If I drink now, I'm sitting in the same party gaff that I was 10 years ago. I'll, I'll be right there Same music, yeah. <laughs> the part of me misses it. I do miss it. I do think about it a lot, really? but I'm not in recovery. I've recovered. It doesn't have oh, my power. I love that. It doesn't have my power. I've got the power over I it. I love that. And like I say, it's the food eating my emotions, but I will identify, I do identify with it so much, but I feel as if to lead by example, because I look at motivational speakers and they're out of shape, unhealthy. And I think, how can, how can you not motivate your fat ass to the gym? Like mm. it's words are powerful, but also appearance says a lot about people, no, their does. presence, their it energy, does. their eyes. Is it clear? Are they, Okay, because we're living in a world with all these spiritual gurus talking all the bullshit of the day. People are using that as a tactics now to get more women yes. or to be more manipulative. Yes. So yes. people need to be careful what they're buying into all this hocus pocus bullshit. Life is life. It's fucking tough. Mm. Deal with it. Push through it. And if you stay away from the negatives, you handle it better. So every situation in my life is tough majority of them because when you get businesses you've got responsibilities i want my family to do well that's added pressure that never switches off because you're always wanting more and mm -hmm. your family to do well so i handle it better if i was to drink and take drugs i wouldn't be able to handle it i wouldn't be at the level i'm at so i just know i handle certain situations by cutting away the negatives yes see when you started then in recovery now eight years 
what was the steps like for the first year, two years? Because obviously mm -hmm. your friendships changed. Everybody, you fizzle away from everybody. You don't, it doesn't make sense anymore. Everything changes. Yeah. Every, and I know you know this well. Everything changes. But I think my change was made easier in some ways, especially the friendship component, because your social circle is the first thing that will inevitably non-negotiably have to change whether you want for it to yeah. or not it's, it's just going to change that's why a lot of people don't change one one hundred percent so for me after i was leaving someone I was behind lucky, exactly i was lucky in the sense that i only had two people left my best friend roxanne my sister was so close to this day and my ex billy who's a friend of mine to this day too he's so proud of me he's like one of my biggest cheerleaders um, he met me when I was still drinking and I got sober in our relationship together. And um, I had two people left, so I didn't have much to change. So that pressure was not on me in the same way. There were obviously the party friends that had started to drop off over time because something that happened for me, and maybe it's happened for you or some people listening, is that I was fun and amazing until I wasn't anymore. And most people, especially party friends, they don't owe you a conversation to say, hey, James, we're worried about you. Africa, we're really worried what is going on. They just move on. They just drift away. You're just not getting invited to things as much as you used to anymore. And now, you know, your social circle gets smaller, 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 smaller. And that's what happened with me. So making that transition was very difficult for me more so psychologically than it was socially because socially I was already a recluse by this point in time for the last year my final year of drinking I was not even going out anymore because I started to get very scared about what would happen um because I would cheat in my relationships and that was that was probably one of the most shame inducing things and I've apologized to pretty much every single partner that I was with because I don't just think of it as oh I used to cheat that's something that I did and it's fine no 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 it, it's it's um that scans those partners for man, life because the trust honestly, the elements of trust the stuff that I was going through in relationships 17 18 seeing older women and thinking that they're cheating but kind of knowing mm -hmm. that they're cheating but because of manipulation of them being older you never ever thought it because you don't want to feel it but when you find out somebody cheats it scars you for life because it really does. you can never get into a, a relationship truly 100% no. open the no. barriers are always there of well I've had my heart broke again because men struggle more with relationships break up than women yes. I believe yes. we're more vulnerable to it we pretend to maybe go ocean beach or go out with the boys for three days and well it's as if we've got it together we do that because we're in pain the, I've lost many people in life but the pain of a relationship is more stronger than mm -hmm. losing a loved one for yeah. some reason because it's that yes beautiful thing of being in love it's the best feeling in the world it's the purest form of getting to the source of whatever it is mm -hmm. on this planet is feeling in love and feeling wanted and feeling appreciated mm -hmm. feeling respected so when some of that takes that away from you and cheats you're not respected mm -hmm. you're not loved because if you love someone you would never do that yes. and if you respected them you would never do that yes. but that then fucks with a man's mind and it's okay for us to, to sit and go, okay, I've changed this and that. Mm -mm. But the damage has been done for other 100%. people. 100%. And I, I, I really appreciate you saying that because I even want the people listening to this that will be curious about exploring my work and other conversations I've had. Something I've always been intentional about doing from the beginning is not positioning myself as a victim. It's all well and dandy to say, I have changed, you know, so X, Y, Z. But there was... There were a lot of people that had to experience me along every single timeline. There's accountability to take. They're people that I'll never be able to repair with. And they don't owe me repair, you know. They don't owe me um, because I made amends, right? It's things that I picked up from the 12-step program, which I didn't go down. Because I went to a couple of meetings, but I just didn't feel comfortable I saying, saying I, I am African complete, an addict. Yeah, I, I was didn't like, complete the 12 no. steps. I dipped my toe into A, yeah. N, A, G, A. Yeah. And I used to look around and I think, oh, I don't want to be here for 20 years. And um, I didn't like the, because I am is such a powerful, it's a powerful force mm -hmm. to say I am anything. And for me to say I am a gambling addict or Every I am time. a coke addict, I just thought, nah. But I've still got a sponsor, Alex. I've Good. not spoken to in a while, but sometimes when the gambling thoughts yeah. come in or the football's on there's a little discussion there yeah. which is very important for that's me that's very good um, 
but I never followed the twelve step program. But yeah. for people, it does work, and uh, for anybody, it's, it does. It's to get an understanding of it that you're not alone. Yes, it really does. It really does. I I commend the AA and just just everything everything they've been able to do to support people for such a long time. And I I so many people that I hold close have been helped by it. And at the same time, I know people that have been in the program for decades, mm -hmm. but constantly feel that they're one drink away from everything falling apart. That if they skip a meeting, everything falls apart. So there's this fear that underpins it. And I just couldn't do it. For me, I, I knew instantly that I would need to take a different approach. And I did. But what I got from it, which is the point that I wanted to make, is that the idea of making amends. So I spent years making amends. I didn't force myself onto anyone. I didn't do the thing where suddenly that I'm sober, I think everyone should forgive me, welcome me, be proud of me. No, I, I knew that it didn't work that way, especially after relapsing so many times and people may be thinking, sure, Africa, you're sober now. For how long? You know. That's the worst feeling. Oh my gosh. And when you relapse yeah, yeah. as well, you can hide it yeah. for a few months. Yes. My mum always seen it though because I used to get angry and she says really? you're gambling again and I used to get really? even more angry because I get agitated. There's a, there's a presence of you. Mothers know the presence. Know. So you can tell if somebody's at it. You yeah. can tell by their eyes. You can tell by their persona. And I used to think no. And I used to try and hide it and hide it and hide it. But then there was a feeling of the energy or the presence you're up to something mm -hmm. and it got me more angry because I'm lying to myself she knows that how I'm lying. dare you spot uh, yeah, it and yeah. That, yeah why would you say that and uh I was just sick of that feeling because people then think you're just a fucking that guy 100%. Yeah. and I again it was frustrating for people to be like sure sure you're trying mm -hmm. you're doing this thing again good because they want me to get well but again th there's only so many times people can have the novelty of oh you're getting sober so i got it um but i did my best to make amends but i knew i knew that i'm not a victim i'm not a victim to my father my father's not to blame for my addiction because that would be the neat story right daughter of an addict becomes addict and father is the one to no he didn't make me drink sure there are things that i picked up in that environment but also the environment that i was in now influenced the drinking alcohol was just around and i took it whatever it my choice still so it's my path i walked it i'm not a victim to it there are things that i've experienced i'm not a victim so with that it's meant making the amends, but not expecting people to just welcome me with open arms and say, we forgive you. There are people, I need to make peace with the fact that there are people that encountered me from the age of 14 to 24 that will always remember me in a specific way. And it's not within my control and it shouldn't be within my control to try and make them see that I am a better person now. No, I'm not owed that. And I think that's an, mm. that's an important thing, you know? So in, in being honest about being cheating, and I've only been in two relationships, by the way, for, for kind of context, I wasn't sleeping around all the time, but I did cheat enough to, um, I would say about four times over six years what was in that two feeling? different relationships. What was that feeling, cheating on someone that you loved? Or did you mm -hmm. love them? Mm -hmm. Or were they just a little stopgap? Wasn't, wasn't a stopgap. It was more that... They loved me so much that it was uncomfortable because I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know... I didn't know what to do with someone actually loving and appreciating me for all I am, someone caring about my needs, caring about my emotions, caring about my general well-being, wanting me to be okay. I didn't know what to do with that because I'd never experienced that, not even in the family home. I'd experienced wanting me to be okay in terms of survival, again, clothed, going to school, roof over your head, you've eaten. So just basic human needs. But on a deeper emotional level, it just felt like too much. But also, the truth of the matter is that I had met both of those partners when I was deep in my drinking. So I never got to choose, or at least I never got to choose consciously. So through a sober lens, I knew that it wasn't a relationship that I didn't want to be in. But I didn't know how to 
approach that in conversation or to have a conversation that could potentially lead to conflict. Because to me, my thinking was conflict means I'm going to be punished, I'm going to be in trouble. The kind of running theme was always in its simplest form. If I tell the truth, I'll be in trouble. If I tell you that I'm not happy or that it's not working, I'll be in trouble. So let me just stay for as long as possible, even though it means that I'm going to resent you and resent this relationship. So cheating, getting so fucked up and cheating was kind of like a allowing myself to be free, very selfish and self-centered and egoic and just an avoidance of conflict at the cost of someone else or someone else not even knowing, you know. Um, so there weren't affairs. I wouldn't see the same person again and again. It was just like a one-off. I just want my freedom kind of acting out and then go back into my relationship, which I knew I didn't want to be in. So that's what it looks like. Yeah, also. Just living a lie in all aspects yeah, of life. Yeah, yeah, How's it, yeah. How's it? What do you think the main ingredient is for change? Ooh. This one is going to be a, well, no shit, Africa. But I think the main one is acceptance. But it's like a radical, brutal, honest acceptance that is that is quite unnatural to human beings because it's not a natural thing to self-reflect so deeply and to really look at your internal world in that way it's just not a natural thing we as human beings externalize we'll look at what other people are doing what other people are saying how do they feel about me in this way so we experience ourselves in this external way so to go inside is just not the norm, you know? So I think when you're able to truly accept the reality of what is, only then can you actually change something. Um, so for me, when I had to look and be like, I've literally severed so many of my relationships and most of them were party friends. Don't see people in the daytime, never been to lunch with people, never been done anything normal, never done an activity with friends. Uh, last time I would have done that was when I was uh, in my early teen years or a little child, never did anything relatively normal, what a normal child, normal teenager would do. It was me again coming to accept the reality of the life that I'd curated because again, it wasn't my father, it wasn't my mom, it wasn't because I'm an immigrant or whatever. Sure, those are fragments of my story, but it was me and my choices. So when I was able to see that, only then could I be like, okay, is this working for me or against me? Clearly it's working against me. What the fuck do I need to do? Okay, I need to get sober. Try, fail, try, fail, try, fail. Can't just have a story that I've relapsed five times or six times. Why the fuck am I relapsing so many times? Not because I want to drink, but because things are working. So, so many stages of acceptance and then change has come from that. So it's not like a... There's no formula, is what I'm trying to say. There's no mm -hmm. formula to it if you don't accept. And I'm sure you've had that. What yeah. would you say? What would you say it is? Accountability is important, but yes, <clears throat> yes, it's hard because a lot of people don't think they need to change. Mm. You know, a lot of people are stuck in that rut and been doing it so long. They've got away with it for so long. They don't yes. feel as if there's a problem. So everybody. It's a very open question as well. It's not a hard yeah. question to answer when there's so many different things exactly. to it, but. Which I think is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, and we can all say responsibility, but the, the key ingredient for change is believing that there's more. Mm. You know, like, mm, you don't have mm -hmm. to just say, oh, you can have more. And a lot of people are content with yes. their life as well. Like, I spoke last night, I've interviewed the billionaire to the homeless man, and nobody really knows what's going on. Happiness is a mindset, and mm -hmm. you can be happy wherever you are in life. I know people who are extremely happy with a camper van, driving around and staying in forests and camping here and camping there and they just seem to have the answers for yeah. life living in nature for me i contradict myself of trying to live in nature but then try to be involved in the system because i want to be more i'm competing mm. i'm very competitive so it's a constant battle within me or the way i see the world i understand what's right and what's wrong but i still do wrong sometimes i, I still do you. bad i'm fucking human but yeah. i don't dwell on it yeah and going through the changes and making changes we can dwell on the past but like you says earlier it's try to convince people, look, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed. But sometimes you've just got to tell people to fuck off because a lot of people still see me as the old James. Mm -hmm. And that's down to them because you want everybody to think you're a good guy and you've changed. But 
I'm at that stage. I don't give a fuck. I genuinely do not give a fuck. I do yeah. me. I be me. I try and do right. Yeah. The majority of the time. But we're living in a ruthless world. It's a painful world out there. Mm. You've got to get through mm -hmm. it somehow and buy it somehow because you can slip back to the old James, Absolutely. the old Africa. But I'm just, I'm t I identify with too much. It's me that makes those choices. How am I feeling today? I feel like shit. Do you know what? I'm going to stay a day or two in my bed. Maybe, yeah. maybe eat some shit and, yes. and just feel sorry for myself. But then the next five days, I'll be a fucking warrior. Right, right. Oh, I, I, I really like that actually because it makes me think of that thing that um, consistency is not necessarily about you being the same person every single day, showing yeah. up the same way. It's more important to have a mindset of consistency, you know, where you actually value and prioritize getting back up when you do spend a day or two, whatever, feeling sorry for yourself, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Because um, I think we have this very just limiting almost hollywood-esque idea of change that you sort of change you arrive to a place of change it that's that's yeah, not bullshit that's not people what it can is. scream of the 5 a.m club right and don't sleep in. if you want to work out to put in this and put in that <laughs> change is a slow process it is make sure listen you need sleep sleep is important for mm -hmm. change sleep is important for growth six hours seven hours whatever it is People need to rest. And if yeah. you're having a shitty day, take the day off. Don't do fuck all. Mm. Do what you want to do. Just don't try and don't fucking drink or take drugs. It's the worst thing you can do. But some people can unwind with a glass of wine or two and that's down to them. Yeah. Just make sure it's not seeping in every night. But for me, it's don't buy into the fakery of life. Don't mm. buy into the external shit, which is the illusion of followers or how many like mm. because people's days are controlled by how many likes or yeah. views they get including myself i still search is that done well today is that pod podcast doing well and i do it because i'm a winner i want to compete mm -hmm. and i want to be mm -hmm. the biggest and the best there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing unhealthy about it but no. it is damaging because it's limitless to where you can go with it and you'll never switch off from it instead mm -hmm. of being appreciative of that wait a minute we've got air in our lungs we can give more but i've also got that competitive nature where i think well fuck it Nobody's winning. I'm the winner. And I think you get to be both. Yeah. Eh? That's kind of, uh, even right where we started, to me, that's the whole idea of the third perspective, that you actually get to be both of those yeah. things. I think we constantly think that we have to choose, I have to be this or I have to be this one thing. And there's there can be moments in which you do have to choose. But at the same time, I wonder if we over, just over analyze and over intellectualize everything. And I think I don't, change does that to you though. To. I think change does that to you though, because we know we've tasted both sides of the, yeah, coin, yeah, yeah. the coin. So yeah. we can't over analyze everything instead of just living. Just be, just yeah. be here now with where you are. And I, I, I appreciate people that want to do more and to be more in the world. And I think this is where gratitude can also come in because for me, I'm also an entrepreneur. So I do look at the data. What is the data showing me around what's working, what is not working? But I also pay attention to the stories that people share. I pay attention to the types of people I admire that want to have conversations with me because it kind of gives you an idea of where you're at, what's working, what is not. But like I was saying right in the beginning, I have such a healthy detachment to it all. It means something, but it doesn't. When I think of the essence of who I am as a person, the the sort of me that is going to be 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, have children, whatever, all of that is it's not going to play a role in it, you know. So I always try and ground myself in the reality of um kind of what is actually important in the grand in the grander scheme of things. But I still value the worldly things. I want beautiful things. I adorn my body in wonderful things because I like taking care of myself and feeling beautiful in the world, you know? Um, and I appreciate, I like money because money means options. Money means that I don't have to struggle. No one in my family has to struggle. Um, means that I can send money back home to Zimbabwe. I can write a book and do things and have people in my family feeling so proud of me because it's insane that a girl from Gweru Hanarare can be at this stage in life. And I can appreciate all of those things, you know. So I I never make myself think that I have to choose between the worldly and the kind of esoteric spiritual. I, I get to be both. As long as I'm being really honest 
and in integrity. And when I'm out of integrity, I don't stay there. Like you're saying, I, I get up again and mm -hmm. I just realize that change or whatever, any other word that we've used today, change, potential, authenticity is not a destination. It's in the little micro things, you know, that you decide to do. And I, I think it's really fucking cool that as the human animal, we can even realize these things and decide to do something different. We're not kind of at the mercy of fight or flight or purely mm. survival. Um, so yeah, I, I take all of this, everything we've spoken about seriously, but I also am like, we're actually just animals in clothes. Like we can relax, you yeah. know. I think it's important to find the balance <laughs> because we fucking are. And I forget <laughs> really the old James. I used to laugh. Everything really? was a joke. I don't yeah, know if it was yeah. getting me through the pain, but I used to love to laugh. I used to love to fuck around and have a laugh yeah. and, and connect and just forget about the problems. Now everything's serious. Mm -hmm. People are looking for advice. I'm looking to give advice. I'm looking to stay on the path. I'm looking to be successful. Everything's serious. You become a professional and you're but Sometimes I feel like going, fuck this, like laugh. Like I like to take the piss, but I forget that. Yeah. that nature. What do you think? I experienced you, you like that yesterday. Yeah. Though. Kind of just like light, playful. And it's um I'll I'll just share this because I, I just love the way in which you're so open because you speak in a way that I just don't hear people speak. Um but I, I think I definitely went through a period where I started to take myself too seriously. Uh, so I started speaking about sobriety when I got sober in 2016 for the eighth time. And I've always been a writer and a speaker sharing my work openly, etc. So my, my sharings were picked up by the UK media quite quickly. And within a year, I'd been on different shows on the BBC, BBC Radio, BBC Four, worked with BBC One, Lorraine, whatever, all of these wildly things, you know, which hold value and have led me to where I am today. And it felt good, actually, because I had recognized that I have a gift for speaking and for writing and, and just taking kind of complex topics and presenting them in an accessible way. And I love to laugh. So I inject humor. I don't take myself too seriously. I take myself seriously, but I'm not like, you know. Um, but I think in wanting to prove myself on some level, which I think is important, there was a period in which I was taking myself too seriously and removing the sort of fun from it and sort of making it feel like now I'm doing this as my work, it needs to be. But I realized even that was self-sabotage. It was out of integrity because I was still fragmenting myself and sort of not allowing those playful, excitable, sensual, uh, you know, parts of myself to coexist because I want to be taken seriously. And it just, it made me again for a short time, I'd say for about nine months. It made me resent my work a little bit, even resent my clients and what I was doing, even though it's work that I absolutely enjoy. It's just, if it's insane to me that I get to do this for work, that I get to have a consulting firm. I get to be trained and work with people that are just mind blowing. And it's my work. And I love, I get to sit with you and we get to share dinner and chat and we get to just text and talk. To me, that is so fucking cool. And I, I think if I hadn't snapped out of that period where I had more of a commitment to being taken seriously, I wouldn't be able to feel this. It would just be another thing to do today. Just another interview I have to do, then another one tomorrow. And I see people being in that mode all the time, speaking to just some of the most incredible people, having experiences that most people could never even imagine, being invited to places and things that are just but not being able to feel it because it's just become another mm -hmm. thing that I do. So, so that I, I don't know if that directly speaks to what you just said, but I remember that being a thing for me to be like, no, I need to bring those parts of me again, that I gave alcohol credit for the playful joking humor, the parts of mm -hmm. you, which I experienced with you yesterday. Um, cause that is actually where the magic is for you. You get to be the professional mm -hmm. things and you get to have those parts of you that are just like, the parts of you that allowed for you to be promoted at that level in six weeks, you know, like that gets to be here too. Mm -hmm. So I, I always think about things like that, that it can actually be a big form of self-sabotage to have a commitment to being taken seriously. What do you think life is? I think life is a game of conflict 
and repair. That's what I'm continuing to learn. There'll be conflict, you suffer, there's pain, there's tears, there's crying, there's rage, then anger. But you get up and you repair and you get to experience the joy, the pleasure, the connection, and then repeat. To why, me, that's what it is. Why did you shave the hair? <laughs> was that uh, this kind of change thing? Or yeah, it was a choice. What? So it, was it, there it, a meaning behind that? Listen, you look beautiful, by the way. But what's the you. what's the meaning? Of, it was like, a bit of both. So I'm I'm from I'm from Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. Southern Africa, where culturally women have short hair. Women shave their heads. So. It's just something that I've always been raised around. It's so interesting because where I'm from, it's a marker of beauty in so, so many ways. And then you come to the West and you're told that a marker of beauty is long hair. So the majority of people, majority of men especially, would never on paper say that there would be, I want a woman with a bold hair. Like it's, it's not going to be, you know, it's long hair, it's seen as more feminine or whatever. Um, but I'm just from a culture that is somewhat the opposite, a bit of both, mm -hmm. um, the opposite. Um, so it's it's something that I've always loved. Even when I was growing up as a little girl, my head would be shaved sometimes. But then I came here and all of a sudden that was ugly. You look like a boy. You know, girls are supposed to have long hair. So I had my hair long for a very long time, had every hairstyle under the sun, had a Mohican braids, whatever, whatever. Um, but then when I got sober when I was just tuning into what actually makes Africa feel good, I was like, oh, I've been wanting to shave my hair for such a long time. And then I went to the barber and then my hair was quite long. And he was like, I went to a Jamaican barber. He was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah. And then I had my ponytail and he cut my ponytail off and he shaved my head and he told me that I looked so beautiful. And I was just, I felt like me. I felt like me, like I could see my face. There was like no pretense. I wasn't wearing all of the hairstyles mm -hmm. anymore, trying to, just felt like me. Did you feel free? Oh because my Because obviously gosh. you look at different so cultures free. from Buddhism, yeah, where they shave their yeah, hair, yeah. then you've got the Native Americans who grow their hair. Yes. They believe it's connected to the central nervous system. So it's just the matter of where you you grow up as 100%. well, where it can program you to the way you see the world yeah and, and i perception. understand that yeah yeah and that's what it all comes down to but just make sure you're doing things for the right reasons and question Absolutely. everything for anybody watching but it's mad to think like I say, everything changes i've got tattoos and at, at that time it served me at that moment i thought mm. wow amazing i felt like a fucking gangster i got a big back tattoo and now i look at it and i cringe and really? i think what the fuck that's shit but at that moment, it made sense. Everybody was getting tattoos. It was you at the I'm time. I'm glad because I was going to get sleeves in my neck. and Right. I'm glad that I didn't. Yeah. But it just shows you when you go through different, everything stages in life. It is. And it's just about trying to enjoy them as long as you're not harming anyone. Yeah. How do yeah. you deal with life now? Mm. That's such an interesting question. How do I deal with life now? I don't overthink it. I'll be very honest. I don't overthink it. So there's no uh, neat answer for that either. I just do my best to be disciplined where I need to be and allow myself to experience pleasure where I need to experience it. And for me, pleasure could be a walk. I'm a big walker. I could walk for hours and just walk and walk and walk. Um, so that gives me pleasure. Having conversations with people. I love sharing tea with people, having conversations. Simple. I, I, I'm someone that likes things done very well. I want to have beautiful experiences, but I'm also a very simple person. I don't like to do too much. I like intimate interactions. I like, I just like simplicity. So my life is very simple, very chaos free. There is no drama. There's no friction. There is no, I don't have ambiguous relationships or, um, I, I just I just live a very, very simple life and that's how I experience it. And I don't overthink it. I really don't. When are you at no. your happiest? Mm. When am I at my happiest? When I'm laughing. Yeah. When I'm laughing with people. I can't think of other specific moments although that that be related to what I just shared around when I'm having conversations, especially one-to-one -one, and or small intimate groups 
or sharing food with people. But laughter, laughter for me is, um, I, I know it's an obvious one and I'm sure it is for a lot of people, but it's just something that's been a constant in my life, regardless of what's been happening. Just laughter, um, I think is so precious and I find it so weird and again cool that we have this thing where we sort of laugh and we kind of know what it means and you can connect with people through it. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that's one of my happiest. Um, do you mind if I turn the question, the same one onto you? When are you yeah. your happiest? When I see my family happy, mm. my mum, my daughter, with my dog. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't happen all the time though. Okay. Because I'm constantly searching for more. I'm constantly searching mm -hmm. for answers. And I understand I'm never going to have all the answers, but I'll constantly search. I'm trying to find the blueprints for people to put it together to say, okay, this is the way I live. This is the way I changed everything natural from um, getting good sleep, proper nutrition, mm -hmm. cold water therapy, mm -hmm. exercise, meditation, breathing techniques, and enjoying the moments of showing gratitude, mm -hmm. having affirmations. But for me, I get joy in seeing other people joyful. That's what I, because when I'm alone, I'm not that happy. Okay. I kind of get sad. I kind of What do overthink. you do for yourself when you're alone? Typically. Overthink, you know? But seeing other people joyful makes me happy. Seeing my, my mum and my daughter retired, mm. my mum, and just those little moments go, yeah, that's what it's about. When yeah. I'm with them, I'm driving around with them and going for lunch or dinner, that makes me happy. Mm. Nothing else really makes me have, I don't know if the, the receptors in the brains are damaged with the drugs and the gambling as well. Sure. Even when people say you're doing amazing, you're achieving this and never thought you would do this. I just it think, ah, that just it doesn't resonate. It just doesn't really feel anything. I'm not dead within because I, I know of how course, to love, but of course. I don't see what other people see. Yeah. Sometimes I try and convince myself that I see it, but if I did, then I believe I'd be more happy, an extra spring in my step, but there's always constant of, you're not really good enough because I was to do a UK tour two years ago and I thought nobody will come and see me, nobody will watch, really? nobody, yeah. And look now. Yeah, I'm smashing it, I'm going to do a world tour. Yeah, so yeah. can I come? Of course you can, I'll get you on stage. <laughs> Jordan Peterson, did you have him yeah. crying? A little bit, What happened? Yeah. Um, that story, it's such an interesting one because I first came across Jordan, not personally, through a video, 2018. I was working at a media company and a friend of mine, and I was sort of embedded into activism at the time because my sobriety work had gained me the title of advocate. And that's where it kind of begins. You be, you're an advocate first, and then you get called an activist. And I was okay with that. It was that thing of, wow, people are taking what I'm doing seriously, that has been given some kind of label, recovery advocate. So I was okay with that. But then over time, you start to become associated with other activist groups. So now it doesn't just become about sobriety, it becomes sobriety for black women or sobriety for women who are marginalized. For It becomes like an identity game, you know? Labels. So you go, uh-huh, deeper into the labels, deeper into activism. And I'm all for activism, genuine, not the performative bullshit we see on Instagram and call activism and infographics. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, so it felt quite good, but then you start to get entrenched in the ideology and a lot of it, if not all of it, is very left-leaning, you know. You're a leftist, so you're supposed to think and speak in this way and these are the people we like, these are the people we don't like. So it's very cult-like thinking and it's exactly what inspired an open letter that I wrote um, about four years ago called Why I'm Leaving the Cult of Wokeness. Please go and read that. Um, I also write about it a little bit in the book, but my thinking was becoming hijacked. Again, I was not a victim to it. I don't blame anyone, but just the environment was sort of hijacking my thinking in that I couldn't, I wasn't allowed, I'm doing air quotes here, wasn't allowed to listen to people like Jordan Peterson, to people like Joe Rogan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyone that's remotely on the right or center right, whatever it might be. Anyone that doesn't neatly align into leftist ideology or liberal ideology, there was this idea that there are no go. And Jordan was one of those people. So I remember I was working in this media company and my friend, my beautiful friend Karina, we're still friends to this day, uh, 
she shows me this video clip of Jordan Peterson's interview with Kathy Newman on Channel 4, where they're talking about the gender pay gap or whatever it might be. And by this point in time, it had been entrenched in my mind that Jordan Peterson is this transphobe, racist, bigot, white supremacist, most evil. If you think of evil, the archetype of evil, in the spaces that I was in, and in most spaces now, that's just the reality, Jordan Peterson is it, is the embodiment of that, which is just insane to me now, as I've got to actually know him as a person. And... I saw this clip, it was very short, but I had such a visceral, strong reaction to it. Considering I'd never engaged with his work, I'd just been told he's an evil person, you are not supposed to connect with him, he's problematic. I simply trusted the tribe, right? Trusted the cult, essentially. Um, and then in 2020, so that was my first interaction, like my first experience of just seeing anything that he had done in the world. And then I remember in 2020 when a lot of my thinking was changed and I write about this because I know that a lot of people have gone through that journey or are going through the journey of questioning what they're seeing around them and saying, Actually, what the fuck is happening? None of this makes sense. Why are we denying reality? Why are we not allowing people to have opposing opinions? Why have we gone into such extremist thinking? So I was in that space from 2019, but the pandemic really heightened everything. And I wrote the open letter, why I'm leaving the cult of wokeness as my, to me, it was just my declaration to say, I'm not playing this fucking game anymore. This game of identity politics, this game of wokeness. And I know that sometimes people have a reaction when they hear the term wokeness because they think, oh, another far right person. But I don't fall into anything. I, I think it, it would be easy for people to try and stuff me into some kind of category or box. But for most things, I'm pretty left leaning. For some things, I resonate more with the right. I, I don't have an alliance to any party or any political stance. So woke is a term that comes from something that is genuine and so important, an awareness of injustice. And it comes from the, I believe, 60s, but someone might correct me. And it was a very important term until it was hijacked by self-righteous academics, self-righteous so-called activists that truly believe that they are the people that determine what is right thinking, what is the right side of history to be on, on every single thing. The people that are activists from bed, making infographics and shouting at everyone online, the people that are ripping people apart in comment sections, to me, that is not the true essence of so-called woke. To me, that is wokeness. I, I think of it as like a sort of parasitic infection. Um, so I was owning up to the fact that I had been sucked into that myself and I hadn't even realized that I had bought into the game of identity politics where because I'm black, I'm supposed to think in a certain way. Because I'm a woman, I'm supposed to speak about men in a certain way. And I, I refuse to do that. So I wrote this open letter and I was just continuing my work, exploring self-sabotage, wanting to understand the psychology of cancel culture, which I write about in the book as well. And I shared a story, shared that story of 2018 and encountering Jordan Peterson's work. And his daughter, Michaela, who's now a friend too, she found the clip and she messaged me and she'd actually been following my work for a while. And she expressed so much gratitude for my work and my voice and asked me if I'd like to have a conversation with her on her podcast. And then 15 minutes before we're recording, a few months later, she says, um, oh, by the way, my dad's going to be joining. Is that okay? And I mean, if anyone hears those words, this is not just a, a dad, you know, this is not just someone down the road's father. I had no idea that conversation would be happening. And for anyone interested, that conversation is available online. You can see it. Some of you might have seen it. Um, I had no idea that Jordan was going to be joining, but he said that he really wanted to be part of this conversation. He wanted to tell me how grateful he was for my voice and my work. And the video, which had been a live stream in which I'd shared my experience of the 2018 video, I'd been very honest because I didn't expect it to reach Jordan, you know, or his daughter 
or anyone in particular. I was just speaking in a way that I'd done for years. So the fact that he had seen that, and this just speaks to who he is as a person. I don't by any means believe that he's perfect. None of us are. But I've really been able to humanize him and understand him and to see the tr the true essence of his heart because he was still able to embrace me so lovingly. And we had probably one of the best conversations I've had, you know. Um, but that conversation, I had no idea that it was going to happen until 15 minutes before it happened, which allowed for me to not overthink it. I could be fully present in what was. Um, and yeah, that was nearly three years ago now. Why do you think there's so much divide in the world? I think it's the thing that I was saying earlier around we have our own inability to hold our contradictions. So we find it so fucking difficult to do the same for others. And I also think the globalization of technology has accelerated that or amplified that rather, not accelerated. Um, and that is just highlighted more. Division is not a new thing. Tribalism is not a new thing. Me against you is not a new thing. However, the algorithms are designed in a way where they prioritize outrage. They prioritize the division. They prioritize the polarization. So it kind of ends up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy that we see people being more divided, which makes us start to believe that the real world, this, is a reflection of online. Um, so I, it's something that I continue to explore because I think it's such a loaded question. But I think a lot of it, I prefer to bring it back to the self because it kind of feels more manageable, which I which I also do in my writing and work in general. But I think it's, we just don't know what to do with our own mess and our own internal confusion. You know, we don't want to think that we might have problematic thoughts or we don't want to accept it we want to deny it so then we just repress all of these shadowy things about ourselves but then they come out online or when we see other people that are free in their expression when we see other people that are curious when we see other people that say no I'm not going to fucking put up with this I won't agree with things that are not true we don't know what to do with it because we won't even allow ourselves to do that you know um yeah, so I think it's a I think it's a host of different things. I think there's the external big tech, whatever, but I think there's also something about the way in which we're just so in denial about all of these parts of ourselves. Can, That's what I yeah, think. Yeah, but we can be easily controlled. We are easily oh, manipulated. Sure. Even though we manipulated in the past, we've also for been manipulated. Sure. For sure. If you were prime minister or president and you could change things to make the world a better place, what would you change? Well, I wouldn't be a prime minister or president because that means I'd be corrupt instantly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, I don't know, James. I, I think, I think whatever I say to that question would be so simplistic because it's, it's just, it's not that simple, is it? What would you change? I would take away money, I think. I think money Ooh, can be, that's an I think the money is the root of all evil. I think do you? money's an illusion. There's no value to money. The, the value we give it is in the mind. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. But we kill for it. We die for it. Greed is what's poisoned men's soul. Greed is one of the most negative things on yeah. the planet because everybody then competes to have more. And I think it's an actual instinct for a man to want more. Men will look at other people's women. Men will maybe want a better car than the mm. next door neighbour. They want to compete and comp competition is healthy in a certain degree sure. but if there's no money there's no ones get more power over anybody yes. and it changes the dynamic because money gives you power to a certain degree but if there's no money there's no rules there's no greed there's no power everybody's on a level playing field and if you're on a level playing field you don't feel different mm. do you think we'd find something else to Something else would replace it. Of course, back in the day, they used to exchange things. Everything was a currency. Yeah, like you'll a give you potatoes, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you'll give you bananas or oranges. There was a, a currency of let's help build this house, or can I get that? Yeah, appliance or whatever it was. People was exchanging. There's no, ever, there's just so much meaning to money. And listen, money's an, an energy you. exchange. But for me, I just see it as a poison and a toxic because we're chasing something that's 
always limitless. And the hyper capitalism is yeah. just very mm. extreme. And look now. at the power of wars. Yeah. People fund both sides of wars. People jump on yeah. trains, Palestine, Israel, Ukraine, Russia. People are jumping on a train. Mm -hmm. People are standing at their doors banging pots and pans for being locked down. What the and fuck? then the next minute we're punishing the healthcare professionals who say no, they don't want to get vaccinated. Yeah. So it's a it's a weird world, but again, you've been manipulated to think Jordan Peter was a bad yeah, guy. People yes, believe yes. Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi were bad people, yes. weapons of mass destruction, Iraqis, millions of people killed. Gaddafi was the health care and no homelessness mm -hmm. and money. If you actually look at it and ask the questions of who are these people, what do they do? But wait a minute, you're brainwashed by media, so we should uh -huh. speak out against that. I understand people are controlled with fear and believe what they see in the media. I get it. So it's pointless arguing. Because the only one sided to it, I'm mm. always sceptical of, well, wait a minute, I could be wrong. Maybe I should have got yes. the vaccine. Maybe I yes. should have done this. But for me, exactly. when I get told it was a 99.9% .9 survival rate, I ain't fucking touching that shit. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you used to take coke or MDMA and or Equis. But still. But still, it was my fucking choice. Yeah. You're not getting forced something upon me because I can't travel. I don't yes. give a fuck about travelling. I'm yes. in Scotland, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Yes. Shove your travelling right up your ass. But now I can travel <laughs> wherever I want. It's coming out now that... There is all these bad I things happening know. and everybody's saying, oh, we got it wrong. Companies getting sued. Yeah. And then you you sort of, um, that's what I think about quite a lot, James, that, again, the pretense. So the people haven't truly processed, and I speak to thousands of people about, about everything that happened post-2020. We haven't truly processed the psychological damage that was done. And now we just have to pretend that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I Even the language that was used, um, even when you think of the language of the unvaccinated, kind of like you're, you're in the category of vermin or rodents, that, that was pretty much the sort of language that was used. And it was nowhere near as extreme as it was in Canada and Australia the amount of relationships that were broken because of that. And just before that, it was race, you know. I I just I just think the media is absolutely a big, a big player in all of this, which is why I think we have to loudly push back. I don't think it's a nice to have to encourage people to be more fucking courageous, to express themselves bravely, to push back against agreeing with things that you don't actually agree with, things that are not true, denying reality. And I'm all for inclusion and openness, but if people are even scared to answer the question, what is a woman? I worry, I worry a lot. And I am someone that is connected with a lot of groups, minority groups, marginalized people. And even in these groups, people are terrified to speak, to acknowledge reality. And I think when we're at that point, I don't, I don't know that we can sort of cower and and stay mm -hmm. in niceness. I think we need to stand up fucking straight and say no. Yeah, but we're not doing are this. To I don't give a fuck if you're straight, bi, trans. I don't give a fuck if you're black, white, brown, pink, green, yellow. If you're a fucking idiot, you're an idiot. <laughs> you don't get a, you don't get a free pass because you your skin color or no, your no, gay. No. Philip Schofield, twenty odd years no. cheating on his wife for young fucking boys, mm -mm. but yet he gets a free pass because he's gay. Listen, mm. you're a fucking wronging. It doesn't matter who you are, what yeah. you are, what skin color you are, what religion you follow. If you're bad, you're bad. Yes. People use these as little get outs, and I understand the game, but. Stay open-minded to it all. Yes, Because please. the world is so important yeah. for you to understand. And if you can get some understanding of it, you can achieve whatever the fuck Absolutely. you want. And just before we finish up, because I know you, you need to be, go away a bit, but what do you think of all the kind of masculine energy, feminine energy and mm -hmm. trans movement and all everything that's coming with it? I don't have any... I'll be very honest. I don't have any strong opinions around the trans movement because I just don't think about it enough. I think the thing that I alluded to here in terms of the question, what is a woman being so inflammatory, people can't answer it or they have trouble. I, I just think uh, we've gone to stupid town if we've come to that point. It's that is where I draw the line. I think it's been moments like that. And I think for most people listening, who are in that middle ground, who are in that third perspective, who are like, sure, sure, sure. Okay, you fucking lost me. I, I think with certain things, I'm at the, you have completely lost me and I will not pretend. So I don't have very strong opinions around that. I just think we need to 
We need to be able to have reality-based conversations. We need to include the people that need to be included and are truly in harm's way. But I refuse to play the game of, I can decide at any point in time that I identify as this and you just have to accept it. And I can change my mind at any point And we just have, at some point, we need to understand what we're all actually talking about. Um, so I think there's so many things within that that I'm still exploring that I don't really have a strong stance on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good, that's also important. That's something that I would put forward. It's okay to not have an opinion yeah. on everything. Be safe as yeah, well. Yeah, it's okay to say yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't... be safe as well. Like I say, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I just leave kids alone. But I think I, we're, living in, that, the, we're yes. living in the gayest generation ever. Yes. I don't care who you are. But if you're forcing something consistently down kids' throat, who are already confused, yes. they're going to feel, they want to feel part of something. For me, I want to feel mm. part of drinking drugs. Mm -hmm. Other people now want to be trans. Other people want to be gay, bi, whatever they want to be. But yeah. if you're forcing it upon innocent kids, they're going to then believe that there may be something that's wrong. That's my too far too. Yeah, yeah just keep it away from the kids. Far. If you're 18, talk about it, maybe 16, because people are yeah. confused, people do think they're trapped. And Listen, I understand that I would hate to feel as if I was trapped in something, somebody else's body. So I've never been there, but I've made many mistakes. I've done many bad things in life. And if people want to see the world different, I'll be different. And if it makes you a better mm. person, I will back you 100%. Same I as religions. That. I don't care what religion you follow. For me, it's an ideology. It's an idea. Yes. It's like having an imaginary yes. friend for me. I know it's going to upset a lot of people, but that's the only way I can see it. Like, who are you speaking to? Mm. How do you know what scriptures are real? How do you know what's false? They've been changed over the years. Religion causes a lot of destruction. It also causes a lot of beautifulness because I've interviewed people and been with people. We've made homeless documentaries where mm -hmm. people turn to Christ. I've got many Muslim brothers and sisters who have got unbelievable belief beliefs about family morals and I love it. I, I think people have got mental health issues where they use religion as a tool Agreed. and then people, the media then blow out of proportion and say, this religion's bad or this is bad. For me, be who you want to be. As long as you're good with it yeah. and not harming anyone, I've no issues with it. But if yes. you start bringing violence into it, if you start trying to brainwash kids, then you can fuck off and I'll always have a stand of protect the I'm kids. The kids are the future. And yeah. I worry for the future because so many people are dumbed down. Nobody really knows what the fuck is going it's on. It's quite and, mad. Yeah. Which, which is why I actually think um, this conversation we're having and pretty much all conversations you have with people, James, I think it's directed to naturally for adults. But I think it's so important for kids now more than ever, especially teenagers who are really experiencing a lot of this conflict around identity and contradictions. It's important for them to see people having these conversations, to know that you can disagree on things and still humanize each other, mm -hmm. to know that you're allowed to think out loud and not overly police your language and try and use academic, uh, politically correct language. No, and you can do that and still be compassionate and empathetic and respectful. Because um, I, I just don't know that we're seeing enough, you know, um, images and visuals of people in conversation in this way where you can speak to me like a human being without walking on eggshells because I'm black. So you should like, really, you know? <laughs> I don't give a fuck who anybody is. I, yes. can, I can see the world the way I see it. And yes. I don't judge because I understand everybody's been raised differently. Yes. Like it was a time where you felt Western society with a long hair and mm -hmm. hating on maybe mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. because that's a certain circle you were in. Yeah. So, but people need to understand the information that we get could be wrong. I could Absolutely. be wrong and everything. Maybe I should follow religion. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should be trans. Maybe I should do it. Maybe and that's the way to, to live. Mind. Yeah, but things go through everything stages. Where do you go forward for the future, Africa? What's your plans, babe? Um... My plan is to have more conversations like this. My plan is to just rest and to feel, to, to just feel the fruits of my labor, you know, because people, people experience you from wherever they meet you. So people experience me now in my success and me feeling so assured in who I am, me feeling very happy with my life, to be honest, in all its simplicity and assume that this is just where I've been. So some people might encounter me now and it's a, well, lucky for you, you have a platform, whatever. They might project, you know, and I can understand that. But I have, man, I've really crawled through my own shit with on my hands and knees and I would do it all over again to kind of experience the, just, just even slight level of peace that I have now. So I just want to be present to feel everything. 
I want to have more conversations like this with people like you that are just open. There's no frills, no bullshit. And I really want my work to reach as many people as possible. So if anything I've said resonates, this book, it's not just another, here's a self-help book. I truly believe that I have written something and put something forward that is so practical. It's not a memoir. It's not a rant. It's such a practical roadmap that you get to create so you can be brave because my fucking goodness, we need it. We need more mavericks and more daring people. Um, so that's that's the mission that I'm on. But I, I want to be fierce, but also um, very grounded and present mm -hmm. in all of it. Yeah. Proud of you. Just Thank before we you. finish up, for anybody watching that's in that life of struggle right now, yeah. what advice would you have for them? Mm. If you're in a place of struggle, it can be so easy to buy into the story that this is where it ends. This is where it always will be. And something that I would just say is so simple, but let it land in whatever way it needs to. Be open to surprising yourself. You'd be amazed at what can happen if you just stay open to being, um, to just being introduced to a part of you that you didn't quite expect, especially out of that suffering. Because if you're in suffering again, you have a story about the suffering. Most of us think this is all there fucking is. So what's the point? Um, but be okay with surprising yourself. You mm. will know what that means to you listening to this. For anybody that's want to get in contact with you, what's your social media links? It's uh, Instagram is my main uh, digital home. That's Africa Brook with an E at the end. And you can also send me an email, hello at africabrook.com if anything resonates and you want to share a story. Because again, these conversations, it's, it's really not about me. I'm the vehicle for it, yes. But I do this so I can understand people's thinking and their experiences. So you can you can email me too. And my website is africabrook.com. Um, and yeah. Africa, listen for coming on today and telling your story. Thank I you. thoroughly enjoyed it. You know I love you. And you know I think you're yeah. doing amazing. Can't wait to see what you do for the future. Would you like to finish up on anything else? Um, apart from expressing my gratitude to you for just sitting with me and being so loving from the moment that we connected, it didn't feel like... I was speaking to someone that I'm speaking to for the first time and you you are who you say you are. Um, I know that you share a lot of your current struggles and feeling and wanting to understand whether certain things are manipulation or not, but I, I don't think you give enough yourself, you give yourself rather enough credit for who you truly are in integrity. And I'm glad that I get to experience that. So thank you. Love you. God bless and Thank take care. You.